All right. We're going to call this meeting to order. It is about two minutes after 9, June 1st. Appreciate everybody who's made the effort to be here today. There is a little bit of a traffic situation down in Utah County. Uh, we got a couple that are gonna that are gonna be late, and one of our board members is gonna be absent today. But Mike King should be here, and uh, Calvin Crandall from the Central Region is not gonna be here today. So, first off, I'm gonna. Go ahead and introduce our board members. My far left, Mr. Steve Dalton from the Southern Region. Next to him, Byron Bateman from the Northern Region. Next to him, Dr. Kirk Woodward from the Northeast Region, who also serves as a vice chairman of the board. My name's John Bear. I'm from the Central Region. Uh, the empty chair next to me belongs to Greg Sheehan, who's the executive secretary of the board and also the director of the Division of Wildlife Resources here in Utah, and he will join us shortly. Donnie Hunter is with us from the southern region, and next to Donnie will be Mike King, who is dealing with traffic. And uh, Mike's from the southeast region, and he will be here shortly. So. Uh, also, from uh, would like to introduce our rack chairs. Northern region, Mr. John Cavett. John, good to have you with us. Richard Hansen from the central region. Randy Durth from the northeast region. Mr. Dave Black from the southern region. And Kevin Albrecht is our chairman from the southeast region. But Kevin is flying back from Africa today. So. Chris Wood. I know, Chris. <laughs> so we have Mr. Wood here, Chris, from the southeast region, who's filling in for Kevin. So, Chris, thank you for your, for your help. Pretty standard. We start at nine o'clock. That clock's fast, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> like to welcome Director Sheehan to the meeting. Has everybody had a chance to look at the agenda? <coughs> everybody okay with the agenda? I would accept a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve it. Moved by Dr. Woodward, seconded by Steve Dalton. Any discussion? All in favor? Passes unanimous. Everybody have a chance to look over the minutes from the last meeting? Long look. <laughs> a long look. Everybody okay with the minutes? Is there anything we need to change? I have a motion by Donnie Hunter to accept the minutes of the last meeting. We have a second, seconded by Byron Bateman. All in favor of accepting the minutes. Passes unanimously. Action logs. I believe we have two things that are coming up in this meeting. Is that correct? Stacy, we'll, we'll cover. Okay. And then the others are not, there's a, there's a bunch on there. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, but they're not going to be addressed today. I did notice that there's some uh, just grammatical errors and some spelling errors in the, in the motions that, that Mr. Chair Bear made last, last meeting, but I'll go over those with you. I was trying to sound them out. I was trying to sound them out so everybody could understand what I was saying. While we're on the, well, first I need to recognize our, our help over here. Stacy Coons, who's our board coordinator slash boss slash dictator of all, who helps coordinate the board and 
uh, the meetings and make sure we get all the materials and all the minutes and, and take care of all that. Appreciate Stacy being here and all her work. Over there with Stacy, we have Tuvo Wood, too. Good to have you here. Thank you. I'll miss you. <laughs> like a toothache. <laughs> Who does a good job for us? Uh, EWR update. We'll turn a couple minutes over to Director Sheehan, and then I have a couple questions. Is Lindy in here? Lindy. As soon as he's done, I got some questions for you before we get into the meeting, okay? So we'll turn some time over to the, the Director. I know what those are going to be. <laughs> Why didn't I? Draw I had 21 90? points yeah. and I didn't draw my sheep tag. I did not have 21 points. <laughs> <laughs> it's your to. make. You only got a couple minutes. Make it get count. Your, get your case make, ready, but I don't think count. you're going to win. Make it count. Make it count. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll make this very brief today. Um, at the request of Stacy and others, um, I I do want to. Again, formally acknowledge that this is the uh, the last meeting for board chairman uh, John Bear and our uh, other uh, board member Dr. Mike King, who's not here yet but in route, and um, want to formally thank them once more and uh, share our appreciation for the many years of service uh, and commitment that you've had the Division of Wildlife and the the resource of Utah. Uh, I hope that you'll still stay engaged in some form or faction. I think you will, uh, but uh, we'll miss you, certainly. And uh, we, we, we had a, an a, a award ceremony here a few weeks ago. We were able to give each of these gentlemen a, a plaque and a few things to show our appreciation there. <coughs> With that being said, um, we, the board nomination committee met. Uh, a couple weeks ago and came up with nominees to the governor for replacements on the board. Uh, a, a list of individuals was sent up and the governor has made a selection off of that recommendation list. Uh, those two individuals, one is fr from the southeast region was a requirement of, of uh, how we fill this slot here. That will be to our uh, current RAC chair, uh, Kevin Albrecht, uh, from the Southeast region. Uh, the other individual that was able to come from anywhere in the state other than the Southern region is Carl Hurst. Um, and Carl has, uh, much like Kevin Albrecht, has served for, for many years on our RAC. I'm not sure how many, Stacy, do you know? Probably at least, at least eight, has he done so? He served for eight years on our RAC, uh, and I think Kevin has as well. And so those are still subject to Senate confirmation. I don't know when the Senate would meet again to, to, to confirm them, uh, probably not for a month or two. So uh, even though I'm announcing that now, those are still tentative until the Senate confirms them. But uh, typically we'd, uh, we would expect that they would uh, go along with those, but, but that is at their discretion. So. Uh, we're looking forward to them. I think their first meeting here will be on uh, late August. Uh, prior to that, we have an orientation meeting. What's that date? So we can let everyone know. We'd like to inv invite, as always, the board members to that if you can attend. And uh, RAC members. Uh, we'll have new RAC members coming in. Uh, and those will be selected and announced shortly. August 30th, and that's down at Shields. Okay, so if you as board members or RAC chairs could attend that, we'd like to, to have you there and give some uh, guidance and wisdom for folks that are coming into this public process, what <coughs> some of the new RAC members that will be announced um, at some point here soon uh, so they can learn a little bit about what's ahead of them. Um, the other business we'll need to do today, and I think Mr. Chairman will defer this to the end of the meeting if we could, but we need to select a new board chairman by a, a vote and a new vice chair. 
to serve on the board. Typically, we've allowed the outgoing uh, board members and current board members to uh, make that vote and that selection. So we'll do that by a sealed uh, voting process, um, probably after the appeal that we've got scheduled for one, uh, when we'll have our other one. I, I think we'll have the full board here at that point, won't we? I talked to Calvin, and he's going to try to get away from a youth group he's helping and come at 2 o'clock or a little earlier to, to <laughs> vote. So he, he will be here, I believe. So last item I have, um, we have the, the Utah legislature created a new aqu private aquaculture advisory council. Uh, at this point in time, that, that consists of uh, 10 members, two from DWR, two from Department of Ag, <coughs> one angler, two from private aquaculture, and three from private ponds or fee fishing facilities. Um, th that will look, kind of have a look and feel of, of a, a mini rack, if you will. And if you go to our website, wildlife.utah.gov, we're accepting nominations for those positions now. Those will be selected by the governor, much the way they do. Uh, board members um, will have that open till June 30th. And those terms will be four-year terms. They'll be staggered terms as we set it up so that we never have a complete turnover in that. And they will report periodically to the Wildlife Board and to the Commissioner of Agriculture. So more to follow on that, but I wanted to make people aware that if you want to apply to serve on that board, Tell me the name um, of the board again, Director. Private Aquaculture Advisory Council. Essentially, I think they uh, will, will come to serve as a voice <coughs> of the industry and try to make you uh, more aware of uh, issues and concerns that they have and that could be addressed either through the wildlife board process or through rules at the fish uh, Fish Health Board or other processes that exist out there. So anyway, we'll educate you more on that as we move down the road. And with that, I would just like to uh, thank all of you that are here today. Those have come to uh, speak to some of the agenda items. Uh, I think this is a very good process that we have set up and it, it, it all pivots around uh, public input. And that's what I think we're, we'll hear some of today and we're appreciative of that. So with that, I'll turn the time back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director. Uh, how many of our rack chairs, this is their last meeting as well, two of them, John and Richard, I uh, want to thank you guys very much for your service. I know that's being on the rack and there's a lot of meetings and a lot of coordination that goes on being the chairman and that and you've done a fabulous job and, and we really appreciate your your involvement, your willingness to come to these meetings, which is another meeting on top of your racks, and to help you. Uh, I hope people realize how important the rack input is, and you guys have done a great job kind of being that liaison between the rack and, and this board, and I just want you to know how much we appreciate it and and uh, value your time and your, your effort that you put into it, so thank you. And I would like to echo that, so thank you, Richard and John. and. Uh, Kevin, who is not, who's out today, but uh, thank you all for that service. And those on outgoing on your racks as well. So. All right, before we get into the first item, Lindy. We have gone through the first draw period with the new rules and some new hunts. And can you tell me, first off, how did the new preference point system work in the general? Yeah. So I put together a little PowerPoint okay. just with a couple slides to show you how it all played out this year. Um, just remember, this is the first year that it took place. So next year it could be different now that everyone kind of understand how, understands wow how it works. Wow us with your vast knowledge. Oh, great. No pressure, but the whole state is watching. And that's one thing I need to remind everybody. Everything you say today will live forever on YouTube. So go ahead. OK, so this just shows. So this is for the 2017 general season buck deer 
application. So this kind of shows you actually how people applied. Um, as you can see in 2016, when it says first cho one choice, they only selected one choice for their general season unit. And then two choices, three, and so forth. So I put up 2016, so we had 54,632 people only select one unit to hunt. This year, there was about 6,000 people that opted just to choose one unit. And that's, I'm assuming because of the change. We don't know. We did have an increase in applications as well, about 20,000 overall. But as you can see, it wasn't a huge difference on the second through fifth choices of people not selecting a second choice to go hunt because of the new draw structure. So after we ran the drawing, this is kind of how it played out. Um, as you can see, we did have about 2% of our applicants draw out on their first choice compared to last year. So kind of what we predicted. You had 2% or 2% 2 2 more. more. Okay. 2% more of our applicants drew out on their first choice compared to last year. And about 4% um, less people drew on their second through fifth. So about 5,900 people didn't draw out on their second through fifth choice compared to last year. And of course, we did have a little bit more people unsuccessful this year, mainly because we did have more applicants and our permits didn't really go up. We, we did take some permits away this year. So that was kind of going to happen. So as you can see that what the this draw structure did, it made a lot more people draw on their first choice and less people draw on their second through fifth. Lindy? Yes. How many total applicants did we end up with this year compared to last year? It was about 130,000 just for the general season. That excludes lifetime and our dedicated hunters. So that's resident and non-resident. Is that up from last year? It is. It's up. How many leftover permits did we have compared to? Right there. So we actually had less this year. Um, we had 854 permits left over this year. So a little over 200, 100 permits difference. So same units, but less permits. Okay. Uh, there was also some once in a lifetime archery only. You, can you tell us? Yep. So these are the new hunts that were created for the archery only once in a lifetime permits. On the bison, it, I put there's 495 applicants total that applied for that hunt. There was 10 permits that you guys approved, and the max point category, the highest, was 19 points that someone burned on drawing that permit. Um, on the mountain goat, there was 172 applicants. The max point was 13, and we offered two permits for that. So that kind of shows you how that um, hunt. That's five, I mean, 500 applicants for the bison. That's, to me, that seems like quite a few, but. Yeah. Mm. Cool. On average, there's about 14,000 overall bison hunt applicants. Okay. So. All right. One more? Yeah. What else you got for us? So you, you requested some information on our late limited, limited entry buck deer. Yes. Loader hunt. So this right here shows you, it's a lot of information, um, but it shows you by each of the unit how many applicants we had, what the max point category was, what they, how many points they used to burn to draw that permit, and how many permits we offered. So overall we had around 2,500 applicants for all those late muzzleloader hunts apply. And we offered 167 permits. <coughs> We had people burn 14 and 15 points for that permit. Uh huh. For that several one. of those. Wow. Yeah. And that one. That is good. So that's. Yeah. yeah. So that's that tells you right there. That's pretty. Somebody seeing some. Exactly. That's pretty popular. Yeah. People like I from what I can tell people like these hunts by applying. It's. Wow. Alrighty. Uh, did the board have any other questions for Lindy? Lindy, I appreciate you putting that information Anytime. together. That's some of the questions I've been getting and thought it'd be yeah. good if we just touched on it real quick. So. No. 
anytime. Anything else? Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you. I won't bring up the fact I was totally unsuccessful across the board. Me too. I'll put that on record. I didn't I had draw for anything. Actually, could you research that? Yeah, actually, I, I did draw a dedicated hunter so See, on the yeah. Wasatch. So that's good. That, I yeah, didn't draw but, my Wasatch tag, so. Well. Next year. I'll have a point. Everybody asked me what I was going to draw out for. I told them I hadn't decided yet, so. <laughs> Nothing. Thank you very much, Lindy. Utah Prairie Dog Update by our Assistant Attorney General, <coughs> Marty Bushman. Thank you, uh, Marty Bushman of the Utah Attorney General's Office. Um, I was successful this year in drawing a general season deer permit, so things are working pretty good. I hope you know it's going to take all your points away now that you drew that. Uh, I so. had to burn the one okay. preference point I had to get it. All right, well. Um, <laughs> A little bit's changed in the Utah prairie dog world over the past couple of months and giving you a quick update of what's happened and kind of give you a little background so and context to it. But the Utah prairie dog was listed under the Endangered Species Act in 1973 and has been managed under that act, a federal act, since that time. And the way the Endangered Species Act works, it preempts state law. That's in conflict or contrary to the regulations and restrictions in the Endangered Species Act. So the Fish and Wildlife Service, the primary regulatory agency over it. But in uh, November of 2015, um, I think it was 2014, uh, a lawsuit was filed in federal district court. The court entered an order finding that Congress did not have the authority to regulate the take of the Utah prairie dog under the Endangered Species Act because there was not a significant connection, enough connection, with interstate commerce, which is a constitutional authority of Congress to preempt state law. And that effectively reverted authority back to management of the species to the state of Utah uh, with this decision. And uh, the D division, as a result, met, formulated a state management plan because for the previous 40 some odd years, all our management plans and regulations were all just tied into what we could do under the Endangered Species Act. We also promulgated a new rule, R65770, to allow, you know, to basically outline the management strategy for Utah prairie dogs. It was different than what was previously under the Endangered Species Act. Take was a little bit more liberal and there was some other modifications made. Um, but that um, has all been called into question recently when the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals um, entered an order on March 29th of this year reversing that district court order. 10th Circuit felt that there was enough connection with interstate commerce with the regulation of the Utah Prairie Dog that it gave Congress authority to regulate under the Endangered Species Act. So the effect of that decision is, is that we now have the Endangered Species Act back in place. However, it's not quite that simple because that Tenth Circuit order does not become effective until what's referred to as a mandate is issued. Once that mandate issues, that effectuates the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals decision. And under the Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure, mandates don't issue until seven days following the expiration of the time period to petition the court for rehearing, or seven days after the period of time that petition for rehearing is denied. So. The plaintiffs in the original case, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, they filed a petition for rehearing on May 15th. It was timely. So that mandate now will not issue un unless and until the Tenth Circuit denies that petition for rehearing. So we really don't know exactly when that's going to happen. Um, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals did request the uh, federal government to respond to the petition for rehearing, that response is due June 15th. But at that point, the 10th Circuit could summarily deny the petition for rehearing at what, it would, at that point, seven days later, the mandate would issue, which would then transfer authority back to the federal government away from the state. 
uh, they could ask for more briefing, they could do more oral argument, they could reverse themselves. And so it's a little uncertain at this point on what's going to happen with this, but we have been preparing for a potential transition of authority. Uh, we've been working with the counties, the Fish and Wildlife Service to try to be prepared in the event that this mandate issues. Um, some of the things that have been done is we've been trying to get advisory notices out on all our certificates of registration to issue or to take prairie dogs and any other certificate of registrations that have been issued is to give notices to the people about the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals decision and inform them of the rather um, uncertain nature of that permit that it could change at some point in the near future where that permit would have no longer have any authority and they couldn't take prairie dogs under that permit any longer. So getting word out to all of the folks that, you know, we put it a posted this advisory notice on our web page as well. Um, the other thing we've done is prepared for how do we deal with our rule which once that mandate issues will have things in it that'll be contrary to the Endangered Species Act. So we're prepared to do an emergency withdraw of R657-70 or emergency repeal of R657-70, which was the prairie dog rule promulgated a couple of years ago. And we will reenact uh, the old version of R657-19, which is our non-game mammal rule. That's where prior to the district court decision, all the regulations pertaining to Utah prairie dogs were found. And all of that was consistent, you know, with the Endangered Species Act and its restrictions and regulations. So we'll take out the, the rule we just passed, put back in the rule that was effective when the Endangered Species Act was in place. Um, we will also have been working with the service to, you know, the transition we found out that the Iron County HCP is still valid for a little over a year, that they, the service will honor that, which allows incidental take, you know, for development in the Iron County area. Um, they're still going to honor the special 4D rule. That's the rule that outlines some other regulations for take of Utah prairie dogs. And that'll have to carry us for a period of time. Once this takes place, the service has been working on what's called a general conservation plan. This will be a more global habitat conservation plan that will allow incidental take across not just Iron County, but all of the counties in which Utah prairie dogs are found. And that's in the process of being drafted and edited and uh, being ready to, f to get further public comment on it. Also, kind of a longer term goal would be a conservation strategy that would amend the 4D rule and hopefully get to a, 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 a regulatory framework at the federal level that would look similar to what we had in our rule. It may not be identical, but there'd be a lot of similarities. And, and ultimately, to try to gather the data that we have, and we're working on that now for a petition to delist the species. Those are things that may be a year or two down the road um, as we're trying to gather this data. So that's the status of it now. We still have authority under the state to manage this, the prairie dog, but it could go within seven days of June 15th, you know, at any time, just depending on when the court decides and how it decides to deal with the petition for rehearing. Um, Marty, the, you mentioned in there that the, the current rule that this wildlife board voted in for state management about two and a half years ago, will need to be repealed on an emergency basis. Does the board need to repeal that or can the director repeal um, that? <clears throat> I'd say the board is not a matter of discretion or policy as whether that gets repealed or not. It, the mandate issues, that rule will be in violation of the Endangered Species Act, so legally we, we've got to repeal it. So is it the board or the director that does that? Can the director do it under like an like a executive order or would the board um, have to do that at the next meeting. I would. We don't have a lot of direction in our statute on the distinction between you know, whether rules are repealed or enacted by board members or not, or by the director. But I would say, it, in this event, I, there's not much reason to have public comment on it. There's nothing really to comment on. The law is going to change, and the rule at that point um, will put us in jeopardy of violating the endangered. So the director could do it. Director could do it. Yes. Okay. 
I think technically and legally, isn't this current board in place until August? August? I don't know when. Till I guess till the Senate confirms new board members, whenever that may be. If we had to convene an emergency meeting to address any of these issues, this would still probably be the folks, unless it'll, it's late in the summer. It'd be difficult. <clears throat> excuse me. It'd be difficult to try to convert and convene an emergency board meeting because. We're not, we're gonna have seven days. We don't know when that mandate or if it will issue. And from that point, we have seven days to make all this happen before we'd be in violation. So it's crunching the time down quite a bit that we'd have right. to repeal our 657, withdraw our state management plan. And- uh, That put, makes it sound like it's even more of a director's place. executive yeah, that sounds action. Good. Get the big pen out, Stacy. Big quill pen out. I mean, if, I suppose if the board, you know, board had any concerns about this appointment, we could discuss it. And um, but I say it's it's really pretty much just a matter of law. It's something we're going to have to do. Okay. So what you just said is we have no appeal process at all, and no matter what our comments might be from this board, it's not going to have any effect or bearing on the decision that the Tenth Circuit already did. Uh, <clears throat> no. I mean, Ted Circuit's going to make its decision one way or another, and, and there's really no, <coughs> excuse me, no mechanism for the board to offer input in that at this point. All right. Any other questions for Marty? I might add, Byron, in the original appeal, the state did file an amicus brief kind of expressing the state's position, which was in support of the fact that the state ought to have management authority over the prairie dog. So, I mean, the state's position has, is in the docket and was before the court and still will be. Um, but at this point, we don't really have a, a, an avenue or a mechanism for adding additional comments to the, to the court. But hasn't the prairie dog recovered and met the recovery goals? Or have we slid backwards? We have not yet met recovery goals under the Endangered Species Act. Over the last two years, populations have increased. And that, you know, we'd like to say that was our great management authority, but sometimes, you know, just better weather, no disease, different things can affect those populations. But the, the, the populations have not gone down. Uh, they've grown quite a bit over the last two years. Um, and. Part of the process we're doing right now is doing some population viability analysis with Randy Larson at BYU to try to determine exactly what do we need to recover the species and, and then reevaluating whether we've got a basis to um, file a petition to delist the species. Well, thank you. Any other questions? I guess this is informational, so. That's right. the information. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it, Marty. <clears throat> All right. Next item up is an action log item. It will be presented by Jason Robinson, our Upland Game Coordinator, and it's the Upland Game and Turkey Hunt Table Recommendations. Jason, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Jason Robinson. I'm the Upland Game Coordinator here in the Salt Lake office. We're going to be talking about Upland Game and turkeys today. So before we jump into this uh, too far, one of the things I like to do is talk a little bit about the, the biology of Upland Game and how they're a little bit different um, from other species and especially different from big game. Um, Upland Game experience boom and bust cycles and are generally short-lived. Um, many species live um, one or two years is all. Populations are largely dependent upon annual production and survival, and natural annual survival rates are low and can range between 10 and 40%. So to state that another way, in a totally healthy pheasant population, for example, 80% of that population can die each year, and then it's replaced in the spring. Um, and hunter harvest generally accounts for less than 10% of the uh, annual population or mortality. So to Say another way, population cycles largely um, independent of hunter harvest. And we have what we call the law of diminishing returns. Um, 
to put this simply, it's um, if uh, po upland game populations are high because of favorable weather or climate, a uh, hunter goes out, has a really good hunt, comes back, tells his friends, they're more likely to go hunt and ha have success. Um, in a year where the populations are low, that same hunter will go out, not be successful, um, tells his friends they're less likely to go out hunting. And so we see that hunter numbers trend pretty closely with uh, upland game populations. Because of this, um, we're able to have long season lengths and, and bag limits, and this spreads the, the harvest out of, in both time and space. And so ultimately what this comes down to is a three-year guidebook makes sense biologically. Um, it also makes sense administratively. Um, because we, we're recommending a three-year guidebook, um, some of the hunts are have fixed day openers, and during the course of the three years, some of those may fall on a Sunday. Um, here in Utah, we're not allowed to open a hunt on a Sunday. So what we're recommending is that that hunt would then open on the following Monday. So for example, September 1st, uh, 2019 falls on a Sunday. We'd recommend that that hunt open on September 2nd, 2019. So jumping right into the recommendations, um, we've got 20 species we're gonna cover today. Uh, so um, on the species that we're not recommending any changes, I'll go a little bit quicker on those and then slow down and talk about some of the, the recommended changes on some of the species. So for California and Gamble's quail, um, we are not recommending any changes for those hunts. Um, it would be a statewide hunt with a youth hunt with a five daily bag. Chucker and gray partridge, we are not recommending any changes there. That's a statewide hunt with a five daily bag. Ringneck pheasant, this is a, a hunt that we are recommending a change. Uh, Pheasants Forever approached us about the current hunt structure and, and asked if we would look into it a little bit closer. Um, in the past, we've had two hunts, um, basically a two week hunt that was statewide and then following that a two week hunt that was just on public lands. Um, it's causing some confusion for our hunters because um, we have areas where um, we have private lands that are enrolled in the walk-in access program. So technically they're private lands, but they're open during the season. And so we thought that we could just uh, simplify this a bit and just make it uh, a statewide hunt that starts on the first Saturday in November and ends on the first Sunday in December. Really simplifies things with uh, no other changes. Uh, so keep the youth hunt and a, a two mail bag. Dusky and rough grouse, the forest grouse. Um, we're not recommending any changes there. That's a statewide hunt with a four daily bag. Greater sage grouse. We are not recommending any changes here. We'd like to continue with the permit system. Um, just to reiterate, most of the state is closed to hunting for sage grouse with four areas open and harvest is less than 3% of the statewide population. And we'd like to continue to allocate 15% of the permits to youth hunters. So again, no recommended changes there with four areas open with a bag of two birds per year. Sharp-tailed grouse, uh, very similar to sage grouse. We'd like to continue the permit allocation system, allocate 15% of the permits to youth hunters. Um, there's two areas open in the state with a two birds per year bag, so no changes there. White-tailed ptarmigan, we are not recommending any changes there. The statewide hunt with a four daily bag. Wild turkeys. Um, wild turkeys we manage a little bit differently. Um, their biology is a little bit different um, than some of the other species. Um, so with turkeys we have uh, four performance targets that we measure each year and those are we look at the three-year average of hunter success. We want that to be greater than 20 percent. We want uh, we look at hunter crowding. We want that to be less than or equal to four. Hunter satisfaction, we want that to be greater than two. And all of those are on a one to five scale. So looking at some of the data for the past few years, um, the yellow line there is total permits. The black line is total harvest. Uh, 2010 is when we implemented the um, over-the-counter season. So you can see the last few years we've seen an increasing trend in uh, both harvest and total permits. Looking at uh, the three-year average hunter success, it's 32.3%. So that trigger has not been met. Looking at hunter satisfaction, the three year average is 3.8. Uh, so that trigger has not been met. 
Looking at hunter crowding, the three-year average is 2.2. So again, that trigger has not been met. And this graph's kind of interesting. The green line there shows the number of hunters afield. And you can see an increasing trend over time. The bottom two lines are limited entry crowding and over-the-counter crowding, and they've remained stable. So even though we've been putting more hunters out on the landscape, the perceived crowding has stayed the same. Um, <coughs> there's probably two reasons for that. Um, we have an, an increasing uh, turkey population and um, more areas for, for folks to be able to go out and hunt birds. So based on all of that, um, the division's recommendation uh, is to keep things the way they are, um, which allows for a, a bearded turkey. There's a three-day season extension for hunters with disabilities, maintain the limited entry season, and followed by a youth hunt and a general statewide hunt. So no recommended changes there. The fall wild turkey general season hunt. Um, the main objective of this hunt is to reduce human turkey conflicts. Um, we're not recommending any changes to this, uh, this hunt. Uh, seems to be working pretty well for addressing those human uh, turkey conflicts. Snowshoe hare. We're not recommending any changes there. That's a statewide hunt with a five daily bag. Cottontail rabbits. Um, not recommending any changes there. That's a statewide hunt with a 10 daily bag. And falconry for um, upland game. We're not recommending any changes there. Uh, keeping it the same as it's been. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. Um, within the upland game guidebook, there are five migratory upland game species. And these species are managed through the flyway system, um, very similar to how ducks and geese are managed. Um, Blair Stringham's here, if we have specific questions about these five species, he's our migratory game bird uh, coordinator. Um, because they're managed through the, the flyway system, they have additional feder federal regulations that re relate to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, and one of those is it requires a harvest information program number, a HIP number. And just for a little bit of informational item, um, this HIP number is required for uh, all migratory species, so the five migratory upland game species, waterfowl and geese. Um, we're gonna make a change to how hunters get their HIP number. We're gonna move to an online system so a hunter can get this HIP number on their smartphone in the field or on their home computer. Uh, it takes effect this fall and essentially makes it faster and easier for hunters to be able to get that HIP number. So back into the, the recommendations for band-tailed pigeon. We are not recommending any changes there. That's a statewide hunt with a two daily bag. Sandhill crane. Um, we're not making, recommending any changes to rich, cash, or east box elder hunt, um, but we are recommending a change to the Uinta County hunt um, based on a, some input from folks in that area of the state. Uh, they'd like to move that hunt from September into October. That's when uh, most of the cranes are in that part of the state. So what we'd like to do is recommend three seasons, 10 days each, with the first one starting on the Saturday closest to October 1st, and then running consecutive for 30 days. Morning and white wing dove. We are not recommending any changes there. That's a statewide hunt with a 15 daily bag. American crow. We are not recommending any changes there. That's a statewide hunt with a 10 daily bag. Migratory upland game falconry recommendation. Um, our recommendation is no changes there. Um, with sandhill cranes during the rack process, um, it was brought to our attention there was an error in the rack packet. Um, the intention was to keep the, the falconry recommendation the same as it's been, which allows for <coughs> falconers to pursue sandhill cranes with a permit. So um, a correction to that rack packet. And what we'd like to do is just keep it how it's been. So uh, there was two board action items that were on schedule for this meeting that I'd like to address here. So one of the board uh, action items were to look at youth hunts on WMAs for Upland Game. So a list of youth hunting opportunities were provided in the rack and board packet. So you could see the, all the different opportunities youth have for Upland Game hunting in the state. Um, and through that process, we also would like to recommend a change, which would be to close the Pavant and Annabella WMAs in the Southern region to the general public on the second Saturday of November for a youth pheasant hunt. That's a hunt that's been going on for a long time, number of years. And what we'd like to do is just be able to put some more information, put that in the guidebook, that it will be closed to adults to allow that youth hunt to take place. The second board action item was to look at the order of the turkey hunts. 
uh, eliminate the limited entry turkey draw and replace it with over the counter. Um, as I stated early, earlier, we're not recommending any changes to the current hunt structure. Um, no, none of the management triggers have been met. Um, so basically to put it simply, hunters are successful, they're satisfied and they're not feeling very crowded. In addition to the social part of that, there's also some biological reasons to um, not replace the limited entry portion with uh, strictly over the counter. Um, there's some research suggesting that um, in, during the month of April, a lot of the hens are breeding and they're starting to initiate nests. So they're laying eggs um, every day or day and a half. Um, and so they're more susceptible to disturbance at that time of the year. And so they can uh, basically um, not initiate their nests or they'll um, leave their nests. The other part of that is the more hunters you have in, in that time frame, the more likely you are to have illegal incidental take of hen turkeys and we want to reduce that as much as possible. So one of the best methods to um, reduce that is to limit the number of per permits that are available in the month of April. Once we roll into the month of May, most of the hens are incubating at that time, they're sitting on their nests and so those um, disturbance and chances are, are lower which is basically the, the current system we have in place. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Rule 657-6, taking upland game. We made some minor editorial corrections and made corrections and clarifications on baiting upland game, and those are provided in your board packet. Um, rule 657-54, taking upland game. Again, we made some minor uh, editorial corrections and some clarification on baiting of wild turkeys. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We got any questions from the board? I've got a couple of questions uh, for you, Jason. That uh, how many other states uh, have limited entry hunts on turkeys around us? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, most states do not have limited entry turkey hunts. Okay. Cause what we were looking for, what I was looking for in this, is. Uh, you know, we go to all these meetings out of state and stuff like that, to WAFA and other places and stuff like that. And, then, and I'm sure that everybody in the DWR here talks about recruitment and retention of our youth. And that's what uh, I was kind of focused on, the recruitment portion of that. Uh, all the other up and game hunts <coughs> we have would give the, you know, the youth first crack at them. Even on our elk, we give 500 youth tags prior to the general season elk hunt, which is one of the most popular hunts in the state of Utah. Uh, we only harvest less than 10% annually on the open game. What you just, you know, one of the slides you have there. So I just wondered, and I'm sure you looked at it and you, you mentioned some things, but it's not anything that's scientific that you think that uh, approximately that it's not gonna affect, but you look at your graphs and you're pretty much staying the same status quo. You haven't, you know, you've got to change something up there to get it better than what we're doing. So, you know, the reason I came up with that is that uh, a three-day youth hunt in the middle, and I'm talking about my experience with my <coughs> grandson, you got three days. You got a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. Well, you got to take your son or grandson out of school on Friday. Most people ain't going to let him hunt on Saturday because they're not going to hunt on Sunday. And if the weather's bad, you've just, you know, given that youth a bad experience and stuff like that. So I just looked at that, if we can give our youth first opportunity, like we do in almost every other species we hunt in the state, to give them a quality, you know, opportunity to go out there and have, you know, like a week-long hunt. So if the weather is bad, maybe they can switch a day and, you know, parents can take their kids out of school. So that's why I kind of wanted you guys to look at and come up with some kind of a different proposal. The other thing is to be more consistent with all the other states that, uh, I've got a good friend, which is the past president of the National Wild Turkey Federation, and I talked to him quite a bit uh, earlier this year, back in February. And he felt that, you know, there's no really no need you know, with his experience. And he's hunted turkeys in every state in the United States and several, you know, different countries. But the emphasis has to be on youth for recruitment and retention. So I just uh, hope you guys really looked at that and put a lot of time into it because I would like to see the youth get out there and get the first crack at these turkeys. I know we give the handicapped people a portion, but they could do that at the same time. We could have the handicap and youth out there at the same time, and then just go to a straight limited entry. Not limited entry, but general season across the state. And I think that would help diminish the crowding problem that we have. If you get more people out in the front, 
but throughout the season, they're, you know, you're going to harvest more, so you're reducing the number of people that can be out in the field and, you know, hopefully reduce that crowd. Yeah, so we, we did look at this very carefully. Um, and so currently we allow for the, the first crack at, at turkeys are hunters with disabilities. Um, and then uh, youth can apply for limited entry. And so 15% of those permits are set aside specifically for youth. They're allowed to hunt the entire limited entry season. If they're not successful during that limited entry, they can then hunt the three day youth hunt. If they're not successful during that, then they have the um, general season. So if they have that limited entry permit, they essentially have six weeks to be able to harvest a bird. Um, we met with uh, most of the statewide conservation groups, um, met with NWTF on a several occasions, um, and, and through all those meetings, uh, we essentially came up with uh, the way that things are going now seems to seems to be working, and so that's what we decided to recommend. How many more locations do we have around the state that we haven't on our turkey plan that we had to, you know, transplant or relocate turkeys to? Uh, over 100 sites that we still have available. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but there's over 100 sites still statewide that we can move turkeys into. Um, and so that's one of the things that went into this decision is we're still trying to grow our turkey population in Utah, and we didn't want to have um, hunting have any kind of impact on that, our ability to be able to grow the turkey population. So you got plans in place to do as many of those as you can each year going forward and stuff like that, just to put more turkeys out in the field? Correct. Uh, this last winter, we moved over 800 turkeys uh, here in the state of Utah. Good. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? How many sandhill cranes are taken by falconers? And what birds do they use? Uh, I watch one. Yeah, and who's got this on video? <laughs> I don't know the answer. Let me let me see if somebody is there. Anybody that knows that answer? I don't know if anyone in the state has now. And the, the, the species that they would generally use might not be a dog hunt or something. Yeah. A goshawk. Next time we'll have you comment on crane? it. We'll ask you that question again here in a little bit, okay? My on the numbers record. on the website. If any of you falconers are going to hunt a sandhill crane with your, with your bird of prey, I want to watch. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? I, just one, uh, and it's back to the cranes. A, a lot of, uh, and I can't remember exactly what the how many permit numbers there are for the Uinta Basin, but uh, I know there were complaints or concerns by the agricultural community that there were enough <coughs> cranes in the basin that they think more needed to be harvested. How many permits are there, and is that going to have any impact on crane population numbers? Okay. I'm going to have Blair Stringham, our, up, our migratory bird coordinator, address that one. So, uh, Dr. King, your, your question was? Just, I know that one of, there was a concern from the basin that came up the last time we talked about this, and about uh, problems, agricultural problems, and I'm just curious if the hunting it, it will have any impact. I can't see that it will, but. Yeah, so we, we generally distribute our permits from about 30% for box elder, 30 for cash, and 30 for the Uena Basin. Um, in the basin, we generally have fewer breeding cranes, and so we, we moved that season back uh, a little bit so that we could essentially put our hunters out there when the majority of cranes are migrating through uh, in an attempt to essentially redistribute the cranes to, to different fields as they're moving. So if, if frame, cranes are concentrating in one particular field, there should be a decent pool of hunters out in the area that can see those cranes there and hopefully go out there and hunt them, get them moving somewhere else, um, essentially just to keep them moving until they find their way south to their breeding or wintering grounds. How many permits are there for the um, basin? It fluctuates from year to year. Um, it's based on a model that we use through the flyway that allocates um, a percentage of harvest to each one of the states that have a crane hunt. Um, our permits, it's about 30% going to the basin. Last year, I believe it was about, I think our total allocation or total number of permits was probably around 100 and 150, somewhere in there. So it's probably between 30 to 50 permits going out toward the basin. Um, and this next year, it's probably going to double, so it should be around at least 100 permits going out to that area. Donnie? Yeah, I've just got a question uh, about your sage grouse. When, when you go out and look at those lakes and, and determine how well they're doing, 
do you document predators around, particularly ravens? So we have uh, like a data field on our, our field forms that allow for comments, um, but it's not something we specifically look for each time we go out. Our primary concern is um, counting the number of, of males. Um, and often we do that very early in the morning, right at, at, at dawn. And so a, a lot of the, the predatory um, avian species aren't moving quite yet, which is one of the reasons the sage grouse like to strut during that time frame. So we don't have a specific data set for ravens, no. What I've seen is there's a lot of ravens, and, and there is it all over southern Utah, but it looks to me like they're probably causing that recovery a lot of trouble. So maybe we need to watch that a little bit closer. Uh, all of those birds have got to eat, and they're there taking advantage of those sage grouse. Anyway, just a concern. I didn't like what I saw. Questions from the rack chairs? Questions from the rack chairs? Questions from the audience? We'll come back and get a report from the rack chairs then. Randy, would you start us off from the southeast, or Chris, sorry. That's right. From the southeast region. Um, there was a motion to accept the division's recommendations as proposed, and it was passed unanimously. Passed unanimously. Dave? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is also a motion to accept the recommendations as presented in that past unanimous. Randy? In the northeast region, uh, Sandhill Cranes is a, is a really big concern. Uh, last uh, winter, the division came out and, and uh, had a meeting with some of the landowners and some of the interested parties to try to see what they could do to help help with the, the issue they have there because they do have what they feel are resident cranes staying there, not migrating, and uh, by the hundreds. And so uh, they, they actually passed two motions on this particular item. One of the motions was to um, um, have the division uh, as, as an action item, add an action item for the division to, to go back and, and talk to the Migratory Bird Committee and ask them to allow them to modify the season to where it was like a, a hunt for 10 days, off for 10 days, hunt for 10 days, off for 10 days, hunt for 10 days, to try to get them moving even more than, than we're able to right now. And that passed unanimous. Then the second uh, motion was to um, uh, approve the uh, recommendations as a division recommended with the uh, exception of uh, allow fal falcons to hit the cranes and uh, which whether they do or not that they did uh, ask for that and and it has been added added now and, and that passed unanimous thank you richard now <clears throat> uh, the central region uh voted unanimously to accept the division's recommendations. However, there was a motion made by a board member to request or propose an action item for the Wildlife Board to request that the DWR to consider a statewide predator control pro program for all upland game. That was a request and that uh, was seconded. Uh, the vote was four in favor and four opposed and the chair broke the tie in favor of the motion and the motion passed. Okay. So an upland game predator program, huh? Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. John. So the Northern Region recommend the Wildlife Board accept the uh, recommendations as presented in that past unanimously. Okay, thank you. All right, I have one comment card from the audience on this. If anybody else wants to comment on the Upland game, please get your comment card filled out and get it turned in. The only comment card I have is that Jamie Nogle from the National Wild Turkey Federation. Jamie, if you'd please come and state your name in the microphone for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jamie Nogle. I'm the district biologist for the National Wild Turkey Federation here in Utah. I just wanted to thank Jason Robinson for including us in this process, which he has uh, both NWF staff and volunteer, excuse me, and volunteers. 
were involved this spring with working with Jason to look over this information and decide what the best recommendation was. And looking at uh, the performance triggers and looking at it biologically, uh, the National Turkey Federation does support the state's recommendation to not change the current turkey guidebook. Thank, Thank you. you. Troy Justinson. Troy Justinson, Sportsman Fish and Wildlife. I wore this shirt specifically for you, John. I'm sure you did. I'm back as Troy, no longer Prince. So. No, uh, on behalf of Sportsman Fish and Wildlife, we do support the division's recommendation on the turkey and the upland game. Uh, we're huge on the upland game, especially with the pheasant and the youth thing. We appreciate the division considering closing uh, those WMAs for those youth big uh, pheasant hunts. This is extremely popular. We have youth traveling from Cache County all the way down to the uh, uh, Fillmore Pavon Upland game thing. It's a neat thing, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Any other comments? What time did you leave to come today, Troy? I'm going to say, I didn't, I didn't think Savers was open that early, but. <laughs> well. <clears throat> guess we uh, got a couple things we can look at here. The crane issue and I guess I would have to ask the division on that. How much leeway do we have? Blair, would that be, you're the migratory guy, right? How much leeway would we have to adjust our crane hunt 10 days on and 10 days off? Uh, so currently there's a restriction that you have to have a 30 day consecutive season. So if you started it on October 1st, you could run it for 30 days and hunt one day in that window or 30 days but you won't be able to hunt any days after that 30 day period. So we're currently hunting the maximum amount that we can um, under the restrictions we have with the 30 day season. Uh, but we are working within the fly process to try to eliminate that restriction, which would allow us to have a season pretty much any time between September and January. So, if so stretch it out and maybe get a little creative in some of these areas. Yep. Yeah. So it's definitely, it would be a great option if we were allowed to do it. We can't right now, but we are trying to work that direction. Okay. So, so that I'm clear, what the the northeastern rack asked for is not possible under the current uh, yeah. the rules so having that we have to work in. The federal rules. The federal yeah. Rules, yeah. So you could have a 10-day season, 10 days off, hunt 10 more days, but then you have to end the season there because that's a 30 consecutive day period from when it started. Um, in the future, though, we if we can hunt for three months, we'd be able to do that 10 days on, 10 days off. For How are we time. working to change that, Blair? Uh, so currently within the flyway management plan, it outlines the criteria that we have to use for all of our crane hunts. And so that flyway management plan is endorsed by all the states within the Pacific Flyway as well as the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so it's a change that needs to go through the flyway process as well as be endorsed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and so we're, we're hopeful that at our upcoming meeting in August, we can discuss it and hopefully make some headway there because it's definitely an option we would like to see as well. Some of the other flyways have that extended period of time when they hunt cranes. I would guess they probably do back in yeah, the Midwest. Yeah, and we're, we're different from most of the other flyways in that we have a very small crane population. Uh, the mid-continent birds, they have a season, I think it's as long as their duck hunt and a bag limit every day and things like that. But given that our population is only about twenty to 25,000 birds, we have a pretty restrictive season here. Thank you, Blair. Randy, is that okay for your rack, going back to your rack? You'll be able to explain to them. Yes, yeah, Blair was there, and he explained that to us at the time. Okay, thank you. Blair, thank you. The Upland Game Predator Program. What, do you have any more specifics? Than I think basically it was just to try to, uh, identify or what the vision or the board might could direct in trying to help eliminate some of the predator uh, pressure on those up and game populations to help them recover. That's basically what it was. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, over time yes. I've had comments asking if there would be a way to 
modified the law on the coyote bounty program to, to broaden that to do skunks, raccoons, a few of those things. Uh, we've not taken any action that way, but I've had a number of times people approach us saying, you know, there should be more predators that could be removed under that program. Doesn't that make it very complex about the way that that's funded? Well, right now we couldn't do that based on current law. That's right. not something the board could do. But there have been requests, so I'm, you know, so we've not moved forward to do anything in that arena, but that well, may be one of the things that you know, referring to. I've attended well, conservation well, organization events before where they've done contests and stuff with kids catching raccoons and skunks and foxes and, and doing stuff like that, try to promote that kind of predator removal where they've done uh, pheasant releases and things like that. Maybe we need to put our heads together and try to find some ways to kind of promote that kind of stuff, raccoon trapping and fox trapping and some things like that to, to uh, kind of help. I mean, I think there might be some ways to promote that a little bit. But That's worked in the past in different yeah. areas and stuff like that. So probably have to think that over a little bit, but I think we'll talk to the division a little bit and see maybe if there isn't some directions we can go there. I don't know if bounty programs part of the would be part of it, but I'm sure there's some ways we can promote predator control on a different scale for those kind of animals. Without the bounty program being involved. John? Yes, sir. I've got one more question uh, for Jason before we get ready on this vote just to go ahead. Can you track and monitor recruitment and retention going forward with our youth? Yeah, I think we can. Um, that's one of the big efforts here in the division um, beyond just the turkey program, yeah, um, some of the R3 things. Um, some of our licensing folks have the ability to look at uh, uh, the youth as they, how many participated. Um, and I think that's going to be an emphasis for us, especially with R3 efforts. Um, for turkeys and other species as well. So yeah, I think we can move forward. But that's something I'd like to see specifically and reported, you know, each year as you come, you know, report to us what we're doing, how we're doing with our recruitment and retention on, you know, turkey hunting with our youth, just to, and the other that you deal with there too, if there's some kind of you know, information you provide us if we're doing a good job or what we need to do, so. Oh yeah, I think we can do that. Yep. Thank you. All righty. I guess we're motion time. What do you want to do? I mean, the the racks. I think we've talked about the, the predator thing. Probably think some ways up there. I think we've addressed the crane situation, and we know where we're at there. To take that back to that rack. Other than that, I didn't have much change coming through the rack process. Am I missing anything there? Other than those two things. Chris, did you have a quorum at your meeting down there? We did. <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. I'll make a motion that we approve um, this action item as presented by the division. Moved by Dr. Woodward. Do we have a second? Seconded by Mike King that we accept as presented. Any further discussion? I'd just like to make sure that that last item I asked Jason about is recruitment and retention. Did we get that report annually on that at this meeting to go along with that and see what we're doing? And in addition to that is just, you know, were we translocating to those 100 missing areas around the state? Is there a plan for that to really get something done? I don't know if we need to make that an action item log or just a well, Maybe we could just provide updates as we go. Sometimes that's opportunistic based on where we're trapping them and reasonable locales or our ability to hand those off to other regions and depend on what they've got going on. So I, I think uh, probably good if we just gave you updates on what that list of possible areas are that we're trying to, to fill um, and how that's coming along. And sometimes that list gets reprioritized based on, uh, you know, a heavy winter that maybe reduces bird numbers. We may want to refocus. So. Um, I don't know, Jason, is that something you could give regular updates on? So one of the things with the, the turkey transplant, um, per state code, uh, we that is approved by the Rackin Board. 
So all the sites that we currently move turkeys to were presented to the board and approved. Um, so that was a, a you know, fairly big list. Um, and, and like uh, Director Sheehan mentioned, uh, so all of the turkeys are released in those approved sites. And depending on snowfall that year and access, those kinds of things, it varies a little bit from year to year. Um, but they're always on that board approved sites. Good. Good. Okay. All in favor of the motion. Passes unanimous. So just just for clarification, um, Byron has asked for updates on youth recruitment and retention. I don't know. Does that have to be in this upland section? I mean, I mean we're we're worried about youth recruitment and retention everywhere across the board, <coughs> not just in upland species. So. We, we may want to make that a, a normal item somewhere where uh, we're hearing about that. Annually, where it comes back to the board, where they kind of go kind of across with all species, where they've yeah. recruited and retained what, across what the board. Efforts? And that might be part of the, the director's uh, informational items at the first. Uh, maybe if you just put that on your, on your dashboard. Greg, so that you're commenting on that during our, during your, uh, obviously it's a big thing. It's it's a big deal. We talk about it at, at um, uh, Wafa and and others. Um, and so it's it's a it's a big deal. And so maybe if it's just on your dashboard and you let us know during your informational items what's going on. It'd be yeah, we've created a new program, our R3 Recruitment Retention Reactivation Program. We have a coordinator for that, mm -hmm. Dean Mitchell, and his entire job is focused on trying to drill in and find these sorts of opportunities. Um, how, how can we better you know, mold our programs to um, create the best opportunity and make sure we don't overutilize the resource? But, uh, but I don't <coughs> think that's been a, a challenge in the past so well, if that's a program with a coordinator I would imagine that at some point during the year he would come and make a presentation I think we'd love to, to. This I board. think you would be very interested in doing that uh, let's make that happen so, so I guess that would kind of I mean I don't want to say right now what meeting that would be because we might want to think about that a little bit but Stacy when would I guess that would kind of fall on your plate as to when that would be scheduled and, and, and brought to the board when when we have time and, and when it would fit kind of through the draw process and, and when we would have the information that we'd need would probably all kind of play into when we'd get that. So kick it around. Get well, back to me suggestion. at some point would in your love life. To, to do that. And I, I think we have a, a keener focus on that now than we've ever had here in the division. So. Excellent. Make that official and just make that an action item. I, I don't know that we need an action item. Let's just uh, maybe early fall before we get into the, the all the the big more. You got it, Stacy. Because things. I can I can early tell you Stacey right now Johnson's they're going to make it an action item if you don't. I, I'm not going to make it an action item. I'm action itemed out. You might throw a pile of action items. That you but uh, <laughs> I. Yeah. I, I think Stacy will get on it, and I bet you would probably have an update anytime you asked her here in the near future as to when that would happen. So I I think it would be a good idea to do that to get a report from Dean. Uh, not only does it include the hunting and angling aspects of things, but there's watchable wildlife aspects too, which I think need a little bit more attention maybe than they get sometimes, but. Um, I, I think that'd be great to hear those kind of opportunities that are available and what, how things are going. You know the best way to watch wildlife, Mike? Through your crosshairs. Your <laughs> Through your crosshairs. You can't see the whole animal. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's – maybe just talk to Dean and see when he'd be – because, I mean, it would probably be would, – I would imagine the board would like to kind of get an update on the whole program and everything. So. After we just did the draw, all the information should be available right now as to how many new applicants we had, how many old ones, you know, reapplied. So it, it's something that's going to come from licensing to help us out. So the information is available. We just have to capture it and present it and, just, and measure it. Stacy's on it. We can present that on, She's on, on, it, on huh? waterfowl hunters and those sorts of 
Thanks, too. Yeah. Stacy's on it. Stacy will talk to Dean. Dean will talk to Stacy. Stacy will bring it back. Okay. As you can tell, it's important. Don't drop the ball on this. <laughs> not that I expect you to, but or not that I'll have anything to do with it. But <laughs> okay. That's it for Upland Game. Turkey table recommendations. Next item, action item, and that is our agenda item number seven. Falconry rule and amendments will be presented by Russ Norvell, our avian conservation program coordinator. Now, this is a hot topic. I think we're all very aware of that. So before we get started, here's the rules. Okay, Russ will give his presentation. We will take, uh, we will get the feedback from the racks. If you have a comment or a question, I will make very sure that everybody has an opportunity to come to the microphone, state your name and ask your question. Okay. We're not going to play gotcha with the biologists. It better be a good, direct, meaningful question. If I, if you need a follow-up question or two, that's fine. But if I get the feeling you're trying to play gotcha with the biologist, your time's over. Also, the question period is not the comment period, okay? You'll have time to answer que or ask questions, and you will also have the opportunity to come and make a comment. And I would ask everybody to please fill out a comment card if you're going to make a comment uh, and get those turned in. Please be respectful. We understand these are emotional issues, Kay. And we'll our, we're all trying to do our best to work through this and, and do what's best for the resource and the people. So, uh, And with that, Russ, we will turn the time over to you, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Russ Norvell, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, uh, Avian Conservation Program. Uh, this morning we're presenting on the Utah Falconry Rule, uh, some proposed revisions to this rule. Uh, a little background first for those of you who have not had much uh, dealings with this rule since it's not gone out, bef not come before the board in I believe six years. Um, the sport of falconry is the sport of kings. It's uh, been practiced for thousands of years on virtually every continent in some form. In Utah currently, it is a relatively uh, small sport uh, with 253 uh, permitted falconers with uh, 206, 276 permitted individual birds in use. They represent uh, roughly 25, 26 species, uh, 16 of which are nor native to North America, uh, 10 of which are non-native or hybrid species. Five of these are a special status species currently. They're either threatened or endangered species. Uh, they're state sensitive. They're conservation agreement species, such as uh, the Northern Gossock with the Forest Service. Or they are a bird of conservation concern list, a BCC species list, which is a Fish and Wildlife Service designation. Um, about half of those are <coughs> captive bred currently. Our state authority uh, is granted uh, to administer falconry uh, from federal rule, um, 50 CFR 2129. The federal rule is uh, quite general and is uh, considered to be uh, the basement for uh, state rules to build upon. States are allowed to deal with specific uh, and local issues as needed. Um, and as I mentioned, the rule has not been revised in over five years. Um, and we have uh, some, a few new conservation needs, uh, but also many resolved concerns as well. Utah's primary purpose of the rule is to govern the take of protected wildlife, including the collection and possession of falconry birds and the take of game animals. It's a unique rule. Um, so we define the sport of falconry in rule as the caring for and training of raptors for the pursuit of wild game and for hunting wild game with raptors. It also covers the possession of non-suitable species uh, that are governed by the CIP rule. The sport of falconry covers three primary themes, the hunting, of, hunting with raptors, take of raptors from the wild, also the care of raptors in, in possession. It also covers, however, uh, the importation of non-native species, abatement activities such, such as uh, flying raptors at airports, so basically it's, it's uh, governing a business practice. It also covers captive propagation, which is the conversion, can be the conversion of wild raptors to uh, into a propagation program to allow their offspring to be sold. 
Hunting with raptors, uh, we consider raptors to be a type of allowable weapon. Uh, the rule allows for the take of protected game, primarily upland game and waterfowl. Um, it also allows for, however, the take of unprotected species. Um, it also allows for the creation of ad hoc uh, special hunting seasons um, and timing and locations. The take of wild raptors for falconry is limited by a number of state and federal rules. The Federal Falconry Rule, the Endangered Species Act, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, uh, also the Federal Birds of Conservation Concern List, or the BCC list. Um, it's also limited by tradition and culture by the falconer's experience level um, and also by state conservation concerns. The care of raptors is covered by the rule, um, providing for standards of care, standards for facilities that the birds are held in, and for facilities inspections. Most of our uh, rule is inherited directly from the federal standards in this area. The current rule, um, it just defines three experience classes for falconers, the apprentice, general, and master class falconers. The apprentices are allowed to have one bird at a time, um, just a few species currently, and only adult birds. And this is a three-year apprentice period. General class falconers are allowed up to three birds, uh, many more species, and many more ages of birds as well. This is a five-year uh, period. Master class falconers, who have already invested a great deal of time and effort to get to that st status, uh, are allowed to have multiple birds of any authorized species with the stipulation that uh, eagle class birds are, have a special endorsement that's required. They have to have, have uh, experience handling large birds um, and have letters of recommendation to, to stating such. The list of the authorized species for falcon for each of these classes is important for both legal conservation and some practical reasons as well. The federal standard is kind of a one-size-fits-some approach. Uh, we've found it to be somewhat hard to follow, enforce, and administer. Um, however, our, our Utah rule is, uh, as you'll see in the red, if you've seen the red line copy, it is both complicated and unique. Um, because we are using native and non-native birds to take protected wildlife. You've got constituencies on both sides of that equation. Um, it allows possession of birds that are, would be otherwise prohibited by the CIP rule because of international, essentially, ESA concerns. Um, it also allows for take of high, pri high priority conservation species from the wild. And it allows, as I mentioned, for these special ad hoc hunting seasons, licenses, and locations and seasons. So our revision goals here were, uh, we had three. Uh, basically, to, to invite the public into the process, so we had a no surprises approach. Um, to ideally simplify the rule, to clarify the intent and the language, uh, and quite honestly, to shorten it. It was around 38 pages to start. Um, and ideally, we wanted to make this easier to use, both for falconers to comply with, uh, for our law enforcement to be able to use, and for us to administer. So for our first goal of public engagement, uh, we conducted a number of informal outreach efforts. Um, we held three open houses um, to hear, hear, hear concerns and had well over 10 other uh, meetings with constituents with the UFA, the Utah Falconry Association, and other, other falconers. Uh, we've addressed well over 60 specific issues. Um, we've addressed a number of issues that are not in rule but are with procedure and how the rules are enacted or, or administered. And we have con con conducted considerable consultation with falconers um, and responded to hundreds of comments, both email, text, voice, et cetera. So our second goal to simplify the rule. Uh, we worked with the AG's office uh, extensively to clarify the language and the intent of the rule while maintaining uh, consistency with the federal rule and also with other rules, such as the CIP, the Collection, Importation, and Possession rule. We rewrote sections to clarify the intent, um, updated the rule to match the Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, Birds of Conservation Concern list. This is essentially the, the candidate species list for, uh, for these species. We have been working under the 2008 version of the BCC list from the feds. That's an older list. Uh, there are 11 relevant species for Utah on that list. However, there's been a, we worked with the service and had a review copy that came out in 2015. We reviewed it in 2016. It has been sitting in DC waiting uh, approval at this point. Um, and we look forward to that release. Uh, because that will reduce the number of species we have to be concerned with from 11 to 4 
Um, and we agree with the conclusions of that. We've also updated references to uh, Jason's uh, up, upland game and pen reared birds rule to make, uh, make sure our rules are consistent. Finally, we want to make it easier to use. Uh, we, we have done a number of things not in rule. We've updated administrative processes and methods. Um, we've built a new database. We've actually done some things that, you, that are practically we're practical. Uh, we've corrected our contact list. We've added email options. Um, we've updated all of our uh, forms as well. We've added language to protect falconers in case uh, a bird becomes listed uh, as a change in its uh, conservation status. We have also added the uh, added the allow. We added allowed take of adult American kestrels uh, because the current rule is uh, hard to enforce and to comply with. Both the uh, two classes of adult kestrels look look very similar in the hand. We also clarified the lines of authority, um, which only derives from the division, division director or the wildlife board and not from the program coordinator. So uh, no, we have a number of small changes. So if you've seen the red line copy of the rule, it's, there's a lot of red lines. Um, the edits have shortened the rule overall. We'd uh, missed our mark of shortening it by about five pages, but not by much. Um, we have over 80 corrections and edits just to clarify intent update citations, we fixed confusing sentences, and the more controversial piece is that we've incorporated the table of authorized species into the text of the rule. The prior rule had been constructed improperly, and one of the things we're here, here to fix is to bring our rule uh, construction into current standards. That table had lived outside the rule on a uh, website, on a web page. We've also, as I mentioned, corrected rule construction to current standards, um, and we tried to restructure sections to strengthen and simplify things. These all set us up for a number of changes that aren't in the rule, um, so shifting to online COR application process, um, adding falconry CORs to the DWR app, um, going to online annual reporting. Uh, these things are a number of things we hope that will streamline the program, make it easier to both use and to administer. Um, and we've also, as I mentioned, updated, created and updated our falconry database. The big changes, though, are we've increased the number of pre-authorized species. Uh, the federal rules allows for any of uh, three families of hawks, eagles, or falcons to be used in the sport of falconry nationally. Most of these are non-native. These are over 500 species globally, many of them which we've, had, we've never seen or have any experience with. Our rule proposes uh, to pre-authorize uh, the possession of 32 non-native species and 23 native species and defines a process by which more can be added through a request process. We'll, I'll, I'll detail that in a bit. We've reduced the waiting period for the peregrine falcon and sensitive species uh, permit draws from three years to two. And we've uh, expanded the eagle endorsement I mentioned earlier to the general class of falconers to allow them to also uh, possess these large class of raptors, many of these are exotic species with extensive wingspans, et cetera. So, I should mention that the, uh, the PowerPoint you're seeing has evolved a bit over the course of the RAC process in response to board questions uh, and questions from the falconers. The proposal before you has not changed, but these next three slides actually are uh, our effort to address some of those questions that have come up again and again. So in terms of the changes from the pre-authorized list, where did we start, where are we going? The apprentice would go from what, through practice and policy, the division considers our current rule to say is 14 species to 15 species in the new proposal, in the proposal before you. From general class factors would go from 14 species to 44. They also have different age classes available, available to them with those 14 species. Master class falconers would go from 15 to 45 species. And the number of eagles that would be allowed uh, would be from golden eagles for the master class only to 11 species of eagle class sized birds uh, internationally to both general and master class falconers. So you'll note there's in the new proposed rule there's not much difference between general and master class falconer classes anymore in terms of the species they are allowed to take. Question has come up, why do we need a list? Um, it makes our rules, our, our, most wildlife rules are structured such that we uh, prohibit everything and then allow certain weapon types. 
everything else is prohibited. So that leaves the, uh, the burden on a new weapon type to prove itself, I guess, as you go along the way. That's how most of our rules are constructed. To be consistent with that, that's why we came up with, we started down the road of, of a, a list of pre-authorized birds. These are, these are the birds we are, are, that are considered to be useful for falconry or are used for falconry. We also have a number of considerable overlap with, cons, with the CIP rule, uh, which allows for possession of non-native birds through a different process not used for falconry, if you want to have a pet of a certain kind, say, for example. It also allows us to have an opportunity to uh, minimize risks for the public, either through and through disease, ecological impacts uh, from escaped birds. Um, there's also some legal and health and human safety issues to be considered uh, given the size of some of these birds as well. Um, and the pre-approved list fundamentally hinges on our definition of what the sport of falconry is. This is the, the pursuit of wild game. Um, and our pre-approved list reflects that, the, the species that are deemed suitable for falconry. These are not carrion eating birds, for example. These aren't vultures. These are not eight inch tall insectivorous nocturnal owls that are un unsuitable for taking upland game, for example. So that's what our, our current proposed list includes. We've also clarified how, the, uh, how new species would be added to the list, the pre-approved list. Uh, division staff would accept a COR application. We would uh, consider with if, this, if the species was suitable for falconry, as I mentioned, nocturnal birds, small owls, uh, insect insectivorous species, or carrion eating species are not, we, d we don't believe are considered well suited for falconry for, for the pursuit of wild game. <coughs> However, if it does, if not, on to the next, then it's a relatively easy question of a risk to human health and safety. We're working with a process that's consistent with the CIP rule um, to uh, assess whether or not species there's a threat to ecological or human health and safety. Um, there's a, the Department of Ag requires a health inspection, uh, health certificate for importation, and that, that part of the rule would stand. Um, and we also consider if the species escapes into the wild, what are the consequences? Um, and that's a, a matter for review with biologists as well, though that's not considered to be a, a dramatic threat. So I mentioned that the species would be evaluated for authorization. The question has come up again, how and why? Um, I think we've covered the why a bit, but here's the, the how. There's basically three criteria that we've, that we've uh, established, and this is consistent with the CIP rule process that we hope to uh, bring out as well for uh, board review as well. Uh, the legal, is the bird legally possessed and legally possessable, but through federal standards? Uh, is it suitable for falconry? As we've come, like, as I again mentioned, insectivorous birds or carrion eating birds are not especially suitable for pursuit of wild game. Um, risk assessment, these four factors, the conservation status of the species, the risk to human health and safety of the species, the potential for <coughs> establishment, and the consequences of establishment as well. There are other pathways to possession that already exist in CIP rule and by division director approval. The question of meets and trials has come up too. So falconry is a sport where falconers often gather to practice their sport together. Um, meets and trials, trials are uh, more structured events where they, there's no intended take of, of protected wildlife and there's no permit uh, required for this. A meet, however, does take protected wildlife and does require um, permits. So the director, in our proposal, uh, the division director would allow for, and this is a shift from wildlife board authority to division director to ease the process, to allow for a five-day non-resident uh, meat hunting license. This would require division director approval. We've also allowed in this proposal uh, for a bulk approval option so that individual falconers from out of state or internationally can apply for uh, this permit individually or they can work through the meat organizer to have a bulk process. And that's my, my uh, proposal. Thank you. What's that bird in that picture? That's a harpy eagle. That's one of the species that would be allowed. Could you catch a crane with that bird? <laughs> Size-wise, I'm sure. I can't speak to temperament, but yes. Okay. Questions from the board? I just have one question on it. Species added 
Would that be in addition to the 45 that you're asking for now? Or? The 45 species in the proposal are um, the species that we worked with UFA to identify species that were commonly used for falconry, uh, both in the in, in U.S. and international fields. Um, basically, we asked for anything that would that they wanted to see on that list. That's where that 54 came from. Um, if other species are would like other folks would like to have other species that are not on the current list, that's what that applicate that process would be. You apply for a COR, we'd review it to see if it was appropriate for suitable for falconry and make sure that wasn't gonna, there wasn't going to be a uh, conservation conflict. For example, in Alaska, they have a, a listed subspecies of northern goshawk. So they have to put restrictions on what goshawks come in and where in their state. We have no, we are currently free of any restrictions like that. Mike, did you have some? Oh, probably, but I, I probably missed something along the way. Uh, are, are there birds that folks own now that are not here in Utah, that are not on the list, the, the proposed list? Not permitted birds, no. Okay. There are the 26, you'll notice that there are, um, there are currently 14 species allowed by current rule, but 26 species are on that list. The difference is in hybrids, um, exotic species that were, that were approved through a COR process, either by myself or most often by prior uh, program coordinators. So there's no, would be no need for anybody to seek grandfathering in for birds that they currently have in possession? Not unless those birds are held in secret. Okay. <laughs> you could throw them in jail, right? <laughs> Uh, and the other question was, uh, when you have these special meets like have been talked about that they've had in Vernal over the years, um, those um, meets do have birds that aren't on our list that can come in and participate, is that right? Or they can seek permission to do that? Two questions there. As, as there are, I expect there would be birds that might not be on our list. We're not sure what's uh, actually come into, the, come into the state in the past. There's not a list kept that I'm aware of. Uh, we have allowed for a provision to, to allow for those, for the for those importation of those birds though, for meets, uh, either through individual uh, division direct, individual request to division director or through that bulk process uh, from a meet organizer. So someone from out of state who was questioning whether or not they should come because they might have a bird that's not on our list, that shouldn't really be a major concern for them? They can, they can apply for that, uh, for permission to come in for the, for the meet for that five day. Sure. And I should mention that it's come up in the earlier racks that if a, if a species was approved through that process for importation for a meet, would it be added permanently to that list of 54 or not? Um, and our expectation that it would be. Once it's been reviewed and accepted, if, if, it's, if it's in for a short time, it's, it, should be in for, it should be good for a long time too. It's gonna have to meet the same uh, requirements coming in for meat as it would for permanent. Yes, it would. Listing. And that's, that's for parity, both listing. for uh, folks coming in from out of state and also to be fair to local, to our, to our falconers themselves too. <clears throat> Any other questions from the board? Questions from the RAC chairman. I'm going to change things just a skosh here. I'm going to go ahead, since there's been some, uh, some question and I think some updates to the proposals and that, I'm going to ask for the RACs to report this time. Are you good to go, or do you need some time to scavenge your uh, your notes? Chris, would you go first on that? Sure. Um, the southeastern region rack was split about half. Half the rack thought the division's recommendation and the process they went through was very reasonable and, and supported it, and half the rack felt that, um, in general, less government restriction was better unless a case was made that required more restrictions, and they felt that, that the division's recommend, or recommendations didn't show that, that there was a case for more restriction. So our first motion was to 
accept the falconry rule amendments as presented with the exception of the restriction list of 54 raptor species. That motion was a 3-3 vote, and the chairman, Kevin, ended up voting against that, so he broke the tiebreaker. So it, that motion failed 3-4. to four. So then the next motion was to accept the falconry rule amendments as presented, and that motion was a 3-3 vote, and Kevin voted in favor of that, and so he broke the tie, and it passed four to three. As presented. As presented. Okay. All righty. Mr. Black. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I wanted to point out in your summary of motions for the southern region, the motion that we had for this was, was not complete. The motion on your sheet is complete in the minutes, and so let me go to the minutes to present this for you. Uh, we had a motion <coughs> to accept the revisions as presented by the DWR with the exception to accept the UFA's exceptions that they presented at the RAC and that you have before you. <coughs> we uh, voted to include those exceptions and that passed uh, five in favor one opposed okay so as presented with the exception of no list right right that basically what yeah, we got there yeah the exception they had yes Randy in the Northeast region, um, um, we've been given a, a, a basically a, a, some information from the Utah Falconer Association, and and the uh, the RAC made a motion right in line with the, what the Utah Falconers Association suggested that that we accept the rule as presented, with the exception of the restrictive list of 54 raptor species. And instead of that list, revert to the current Utah Falconry rule of permissive list of raptor species that has been in place since 2010 of any raptor species of the order. And then there's three words there. Words there. I'm not going to try to go, but I bet Dr. King could do it for me. But but that was the uh, the motion, and it uh, passed five in favor, one opposed, with two abstained. One of the abstentions was our was our tribal member, which in their culture. Um, I think I think disagree with a little bit of the falconry stuff. Okay. <coughs> so you accepted the falconer's list, not the division's list. Exactly. Okay. Richard. Okay. Um, <coughs> Central Region uh, motion was made to accept the division recommendations with one exception that the DWR remove the list of 54 bird species and replace it with the list of the three families as identified by the federal government. Uh, that was seconded and the vote was six in favor and two opposed. So that's basically what the right. Northeast did. Um, yeah. Basically no restrictions. Yeah, and the Southern, yes. John? Hey, so the Northern region. You had to have loved this meeting, just all <laughs> birds, right? Just great. all birds all the time. <laughs> Best way to go out of the rack process. All right, man. In this meeting, <laughs> definitely. Um, so the Northern region uh, had a recommendation or a motion to recommend the wildlife board accept the falconry room amendments as presented with the exception of the new list and ask that the wildlife board establish a stakeholders group to formulate a new list. It was felt and conveyed by both sides, I think, of the argument that some stakeholders were left out of the process of the list creation and their voice wasn't um, heard at that point and so they'd like to have that. So that motion passed unanimous. So you didn't vote for either list, you want a new list. Well, and by default, the current 
system list would okay. be in place. Can I ask a question? Sure. What what groups specifically stakeholders felt like that they were left out? Um, I think the non-consumptive community had that feeling. All righty. Uh, Director, do you have anything you'd like to add to this real quick? Sure. I, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Russ for uh, spending a lot of time working on this, uh, along with Greg Hansen, our Attorney General rep who put this together. I'm sure we'll be hearing more from them a little bit later this morning as we work through this. But I think they've done an excellent job. I think there were good efforts made to work with the Falconers over many months here. I uh, didn't agree on everything, but uh, as kind of a process check, it's, it's very common for us as we present to five racks, which we've done here on this matter, to regroup, if you will, back at DWR and, and see what we learned before we come to the, the board meeting. Uh, oftentimes, we'll, uh, it's quite common, particular in big game, to say, here's what we heard and here's what we think we can live with and, and deal with so that you have a, a way to land as you debate and discuss this, this, these processes. So we've done that here and said we've heard uh, concern about the list, <coughs> four or five racks. We're not supportive of it, as you've just heard. Uh, but we've also heard, not as vocally, but from others via email and, and other contacts out there that they are supportive of some form of a list. Uh, uh, but what we've uh, asked Russ to prepare and, and Greg Hansen to work on is uh, if this board uh, believes that a list is not, or the list we've proposed is not the right thing, to at least give some options like we often do so that your board, you as a board have a way to get uh, to the end of this discussion. So uh, maybe we, we could have Russ uh, mention or go over a few things of concern uh, that we want to make you aware of as we do this. And, and at that point, I think there's, here's Mr. Chairman, there's plenty of audience here who would I like to ask questions or make comments. But I think this route will ensure that we don't have to go through all of this twice this morning. So that's what I think we've got ready for you. Is, is the board okay with that? If we hear maybe some some options in that and that way when the when the uh, audience is able to get up and ask questions and make comments they might be better served by having those that information as well instead of wondering what the the division might come up with is is maybe a compromise i, th I think we'd all be well served to have that information beforehand before we make comments and ask questions so that we can have a maybe a better direction to so russ go ahead unless the, if, if the board's okay with that Russ, go ahead. So I did prepare another slide. It's a little bit on the small and small text size. I hope you can read that okay. Um, so as Greg mentioned, uh, Dr. Chan mentioned, we did get su substantial public comment on the proposal um, and specifically targeted towards the list of allowable species or the pre-authorized list as I presented it here. Um, if the Wildlife Board determines that uh, having a more, list more restrictive than the federal list is uh, appropriate, uh, we re we'd re um, request uh, consideration of the following uh, provisions, I guess. There are five. Um, the first and foremost is to retain the division's ability to regulate wild capture of native birds. This is fundamental to our ability to uh, manage wildlife appropriate in this state. It's uh, both critical to our managing our, our populations, um, cooperating with federal conservation partners, both formally and informally, um, and quite fundamentally to avoiding endangered species listings down the line. Uh, this is part of our establishing and maintaining credibility there. Uh, we'd ask to retain the proposed list of these 14 species uh, with the other, other possession restrictions for apprentices. The apprentice period is um, an evolved cultural practice, if you will, for falconry. It's, it's the training period for both the falconer and the bird. But we don't teach driver's ed using Maseratis and monster trucks. Um, there's an appropriate list of species for, um, for, for apprentices, and we feel this is a, an appropriate uh, list. We'd also ask to retain the uh, general class uh, uh, endorsement process for large raptors. So while general class falconers could um, 
possess these large exotic raptors that we would ask the board consider retaining the endorsement process same as the same as a master class falconer would have to pr to follow uh, to hold these large birds uh, so have to prove up they, they, they've got experience handling and caring for these very large birds and they have the, the correct facilities for that as well we'd also like to uh, improve the division's capac capacity for uh, conducting inspections as part of the federal rule that, and the responsibilities that we inherit from that rule we are uh, obliged to inspect facilities to make sure they are appropriate for the number and species of birds being held. Um, to do that, we need to be able to know what birds and how many are being held where. So during, the, we ask that there, we be allowed to make some changes to the rule that would allow us to know, sweet notification. So during the application process, um, the initial application process, and when the, when the permittee changes either number or size of or moves and changes facilities these are all trigger uh, facilities inspections during the in the current rule um, so it also give us that opportunity in the proposed changes uh, we also should mention that we received a number of uh, non-substantive changes uh, requested by the fish and wildlife service that arrived after the rack process uh, we do not we've re been reviewing these none of these uh, have risen to the level of, of changing the intent uh, but they are primarily citations and formats um, that uh, we would need to comply with, but they are not major changes. We'd ask the board also consider that provision. Any questions from the board? So the, the intent of these five um, stipulations would be if if we chose not to have the list as the four of the five racks, you would ask that we implement these in addition to the presented, to what you presented originally. Correct, yes. Any other questions from the board? Rack chairs, are you guys? <clears throat> yeah, does that mean that there won't be a list or there is a list? I mean right. anything yet. But what they're asking for is that if we, if we, for instance, if we did vote like your rack did, that there would be no list that they're asking to add this to the original proposal. Okay. That's right, Russ. We're reading that right. Correct. That right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. The federal rule provides that that basement of those three, uh, th those three families, uh, okay. which includes most. Raptors in the world. Okay. All righty. <clears throat> and is that any bird that, that falls into those three Correct. families? That uh, they're not are, specifically precluded. They're, they are not specifically precluded by other rules, such as the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, et cetera. Those other federal and state uh, statutes. Okay. All right. We're good. I will now open it up to questions from the audience. Okay, if you have a question, please come to the microphone over here, state your name for the record, and then ask your question. And uh, please try to keep them pertinent to the discussion. We have any questions? <coughs> Apparently you did a very good job <laughs> going through the racks and we have a very educated public here today that are okay we got, one. got one come on up come on up ma'am if you'd come over here to the microphone and state your name and remember this is questions and yeah. we will shortly go to the comment period Um, okay, my name is Lynn Carroll, and my question involves the, the idea of the total number of raptor species that, that there are. Um, I have seen no list of, you know, every raptor that's, that would be allowed as, as members of the, the families that are uh, 
listed or the, the two orders that are listed. Um, but I tried to uh, come up with a number and got something like 411 to 440 or so, depending on who's counting. And yet you mentioned <coughs> something about fi over 500. And I'm wondering. We, we may just be using slightly different list. There are uh, a number of international, competing international authorities on, on, on the numbers of species globally. And, uh, for example, we have the North, you know, the uh, American Ornithologist Union is a definitive source for North America, but that's just for North America. Um, and quite honestly, uh, some species are either lumped or split by taxonomists, um, depending on whose whose count you're using. The 500 number is is admittedly supposed to be more of a rough and ready number. It is a, a orders of magnitude larger than what we're discussing here in Utah. Um, but I have not actually done a formal tally with a particular uh, source as yet. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, we will go into the comment portion of our meeting. Now, we have a lot of comments. Everybody will get three minutes. <coughs> I think uh, the board has a pretty good grasp on uh, on the direction the discussion's gone, on what the concerns are, what the options are, and uh, I think the the different uh, user groups and different groups have been involved have been very done a very good job of being active. Uh, in the process up to this point. So uh, we appreciate that. So everybody will get three minutes and uh, we will start with Mark Housekeeper. Mark will be followed by Zach, is it Fossum? Zach, did I see your name right? And after Zach, Patrick Shane. Time is yours. Thank you very much. Mark Housekeeper, I'm a, just a falconer in Lehigh City. Uh, thank the board for the opportunity to uh, to comment, and uh, also thank the division for the efforts that uh, that they've undertaken to streamline a lot of the administrative stuff. Um, I take a whole lot less than three minutes in saying that the most recent, uh, the last slide that was up about the the board's position on if the um, I mean the division's position if the wildlife board decides to approve the revisions but not um, not approve, quote, the list. I think that their sort of fallback position uh, to me sounds very reasonable. And again, I'm not speaking for the, the UFA or anybody like that, but uh, um, I would encourage the board to uh, to approve the, the rule as presented with the exception of the list and follow the federal guidelines. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, Zach. Zach will be followed by Patrick Shane. Patrick will be followed by Justin Searle. Okay, uh, my name is Zach Fossum, and I'm currently the president, acting president of the Utah Falconers Association. Um, and I, like I said, they've said before, this has been kind of a, an interesting process for me to go through. I haven't ever gone through the rack boards before, and I haven't been as intimately involved with rulemaking as I have been in this situation. Um, my job is to enforce the rules, you know, in a different capacity than in the wildlife capacity. I work as a detective in the special victims unit. Um, and the thing that surprised me about this presentation is how the presentation has evolved so much um, between rack to rack to rack. And the concerning thing that I have is I just feel like maybe that the representation that was at the first rack as opposed to what was at the last rack was significantly different with even the admission of the slides changing and the emphasis being changed from rack to rack. Um, ultimately, I think that the racks, um, I, 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 I appreciate all the participation from everybody that's been involved, but I think that ultimately the racks um, have kind of helped to clarify our, our stance on it in the fact that there's not really any biological evidence or anything that really dictates the necessity of having this uh, 
uh, list. Um, and that the proposal, I mean, the emphasis itself has changed from health and human safety and from the structure of the way the law was written to the way that now we just want to make it similar to other laws within the Division of Wildlife. Um, the emphasis have changed so much that I just, I hope that the RACs understand that they may have seen different presentations or they may have gotten different input based on these, um, based on these different presentations that were brought to each RAC. Um, I too, I, I, I support, I like the, the, the fallback plan that's been laid out before you. And I think that with the, just a couple of little tweaks and adjustments here or there, you know, like with the Eagle stuff and just clarifying that the 14 birds on that list would be for, you know, wild take and not have any effect on captive bred raptors for the apprentice falconers uh, within the state, I think is, is reasonable. And I think that our objective as law enforcers and as people that do this for a living, that the laws are written based on what is reasonable and we enforce them based on what reasonable people do. And I, I don't think the list itself is reasonable and I like the, the three orders that are listed in the federal rule. We talked about having similarities with the wild turkeys from state to state and I don't know why we can't have the same similarities when it comes to the possession of these raptors. Um, especially when the collection, importation, and possession is, a lot of it is mandated by the Department of Agriculture. And when these birds are imported, they receive, they have to have health examinations and health certifications to even come in our state. So it seems like it's kind of a, a, double, a double enforcement. Um, that being said, I think that um, their fallback plan is reasonable. And I, I say that we move, I'd like to go along with not proposing and go in line with what the rest of the RACs have kind of agreed on that the list not be imposed and that we come up with an alternate solution. So thank you and thank you again for all the time that's been put into this. Thank you, sir. Next I have Patrick Shane, followed, Patrick will be followed by Justin Searle and Justin will be followed by Caleb Stroh. Patrick Shane, um, Falconer and um, I've been involved for a lot of years uh, with the RAC meetings uh, as they've come up and this, this particular uh, cycle, uh, we've seen uh, a lot of interest in a uh, falconry proposal, and it's reassuring to see the process go through each of the racks and opinions being stated and, and conclusions uh, and proposals coming forth uh, that seem reasonable, and I think the racks have done that. And I uh, uh, congratulate all of you that it's a labor of love for you RAC people that go to all these meetings. Thank you for what you do. And I'd also like to thank uh, DWR, particularly Russ and his team, uh, for all the time and effort they put into making uh, the falconry rule cleaner uh, to uh, get it down to a, a readable size. Uh, that was no small effort, and uh, they took a lot of our input Zach and I went up for a couple of two hour plus meetings and uh, I want to thank uh, the DWR and those that worked on this for, for doing a great job. Uh, like the other falconers, uh, I'm opposed to a list. The other states surrounding Utah um, use the, uh, don't have the restrictions and there's no really uh, it, it need for those restrictions and I support that. Uh, I do think that um, the DWR and Russ have come up with a good alternative in those five proposals. I don't, uh, haven't seen that before. I would have liked to have had a heads up on that to, to take a good look at it. I haven't, but uh, a quick look at it right now. I don't see anything on there that I'm objecting to. Um, and so uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for their efforts and uh, support what's being done. Thank you, sir. Justin Searle. Justin will be followed by Caleb Stroh. And after Caleb, it'll be Heather Dove. Thank you, President. And mm -hmm. uh, once again, just like everybody before me, thank you very much for Russ and the DWR and, and the work they've done in this proposal. And not just that, just the work that he's done with staffing changes and, and creating the database and making things so much smoother here at the Division for Falconers. Um, and right up front, I fully, fully support the, the alternate plan that uh, Russ presented with the, the five alternate uh, options uh, if we reject the, the list of birds. My biggest concern with the list of the, the 54 raptors 
is within 100 miles from the, from the border of Utah, we have birds that's not on that list of 54 species that are actively being bred, actively being flown by falconers, and have active interest by falconers in the state to be able to be used. Um, and not only that, having very good friends flying those species, I would like to be able to invite them to my house, not at a meet, but be able to come and actually go hunting with me and sharing that, that sport with them here locally inside of, inside of our own communities. My other big concern with the list of 54 species is that also does effectively remove any new additions or any changes or modifications to that list effectively out of the RAC process and out of the board process. And I think that that needs to be something that is so critical, a list of species critical to our sport. I think that's something that needs to stay inside of the RAC process, inside of the wildlife board process. So by removing the list of 54 species, re reverting back down to the current three classes, I think is the, the cleanest, <laughs> easiest method to do that. And uh, I fully support the, the five alternate options that Russ presented. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is it Caleb is next, followed by Heather Dove, and then Lynn Carroll. My name is Caleb Stroh, a local falconer from Kaysville, Utah. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to address both the board and the division representatives. Um, a couple of my points have already been made by other folks up here. Um, I would like to make one really important point that I think stands out uh, pretty substantially, and that is that four out of five rack boards agreed on one thing that wasn't agreeing with the division. And you guys have been on the board for some time. That very rarely happens. I mean, how many times do you go to a, a, a whole, through a whole rack process and all five of them essentially, if one was a tiebreaker, agreed on something that wasn't what the division proposed. And I think the reason for that was it was very difficult uh, for the division perhaps to articulate a need for that list. And, uh, you know, if just two of them voted in favor, oh, let's do the list, well, that's, that's about how these rack board, these rack meetings go. But for all five of them essentially, uh, I think that's very significant and, and should be taken, uh, should be noted. And uh, thank you for your time and um, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Heather Dove, and then my last comment card is Lynn Carroll. And if I don't have any from anybody else, if anybody else would like to comment, would you bring it up, the comment card up to Stacy and she'll get it over to us. My name's Heather Dove, and I'm here to represent Great Salt Lake Audubon, which is the oldest conservation organization in the state. Great Salt Lake Audubon supports the time-honored tradition of falconry, the hunting of wild quarry in its natural state and habitat by means of a trained bird of prey. Falconry represents one of the most beautiful and intimate relationships between humans and another species. We appreciate the effort undertaken by DWR to update the falconry rule, while we agree with the majority of the revisions, we oppose the introduction of 40 species uh, beyond the original 14, many of which are unsuitable for falconry. A bird of prey's behavior in a captive environment, its responsiveness to training, and its prey and hunting habitats should all be considered in relation to selecting and using a species for falconry. The inclusion of the additional 40 species seems to be more about vanity bird ownership than the true sport of falconry. The 40 species uh, included are non-native to the U.S. and are considered, considered exotic and pose the threat of establishment and disease transmission. Many of the species do not hunt prey species. Uh, many of them prey on small rodents and invertebrates that are not considered wild game. For example, the common black hawk feeds primarily on crabs and small vertebrates. A number of species such as the owls only hunt at night and are therefore not suitable for legal hunting. Several species pose a threat to both human health and the environment, such as the harpy or martial eagles. In addition, ownership of these birds may contribute to the trade of exotic wildlife, which is a very, seri very serious issue in itself, not to mention the displacement of the birds from their native habitats and potential population declines, which is an issue for those birds as uh, near threatened, vulnerable, or endangered. In addition, the changes allowing general class falconers who have very limited experience to own birds of prey that are dangerous and potentially harmful to human health is simply wrong. On top of these issues, DWR has no funding to manage the existing falconry program, let alone expansion of the program to 54 species, most of which are exotic species 
adding yet another level of complexity. While we encourage you to accept the falconry rule changes, we strongly urge you to reject the addition of the 40 species of exotic species and limit the original to the original 14 species, which are common to North America and appropriate for falconry. And if you reject the list, um, we would like to see the 14, but if you reject the 54 list, then we would support uh, the alternate plan that DWR uh, presented today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Lynn Carroll, followed by Carter Wilford. Hi, <clears throat> Hi and thank you for uh, taking our comments today. Um, first of all, there's a difference. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm representing the Wasatch Audubon Society, and you'll notice that um, bird watchers were not consulted in the original uh, uh, formulation of, of the rule change. Um, we differ somewhat in our philosophy about falconry in that the falconers would like to be able to uh, choose a, a nocturnal owl, for instance, uh, because it is a, it is a raptor. Um, and we don't think it's fair to the owl to make it uh, hunt during the day and um, or even try to make it hunt during the day. But um, our biggest concerns are, are conservation concerns and uh, especially with uh, the take of, of the young or adult raptor for use uh, in falconry. So this is separate from possession. Uh, and I think the rule might be best completely changed to separate these two, uh, two things. Have a list of uh, restrictions on take more than we already have. Um, for instance, the common black hawk is totally uncommon in Utah, and to allow any take from a nest would, uh, would keep all of us bird watchers from ever being able to see a common black hawk in Utah because they would soon be wiped out. Um, and, uh, and we have uh, concerns about um, just having enough limit on uh, take of birds of conservation concern, the sensitive species, et cetera. And we do have the, the additional concern about uh, exotic species trade being um, increased by the use uh, in falconry uh, in general. And it would be nice to countrywide have bigger limitations on that. Thank you, ma'am. Carter Wilford. And that's the last comment card I have. If anybody else wants to comment, get your card in. Carter Wilford, again, I want to thank everyone for the participation. I know this has been uh, a cumbrous uh, time with uh, talking about the roles and the different viewpoints we have. Um, some of the things that I want to bring up is that in the current rule right now, the division is currently uh, the three species, the form species is what is being approved. And the 14 species list, or 14 species is not what's been enforced. And in the past, there has never been an approval, or never been an approval process for falconry with, in regard to exotics. Um, the second thing I wanted to make is I have a good friend named Clayton White. He's a renowned biologist. Uh, he's worked on the peregrines throughout the ages. He's probably one of the leading biologists when it comes to um, the reintroduction of peregrines in the United States and in, in the world. He's, he's rolled around. And, and his, his stance on this is that there is no environmental impact 
And I'd also like to make you guys aware of that falconers are very much involved in the biology of raptors. Um, if you look to a lot of the foundations throughout the nation, a lot of those foundations were, were made from um, falconers. Um, you look at the peregrine right now that is saving the condor, it was founded by falconers. Uh, falconers are very concerned about the wildlife of birds of prey and their species. You look at the Partners for Grouse, which is founded by falconers again. We are very conservation driven and we are very aware of, of the things that, that can maybe uh, you know, affect our, our, uh, our, our hobby. Um, the other thing I want to make too is that with having NAFA meets in Utah and having an approval process, I feel that that would be very cumbersome for inviting falconers to the state. Um, again, a lot of times with falconers, they, you know, just like with hunting, they say, hey, I want to come up next Saturday. Let's go hunting. And if they have some of those exotic species or that we feel are exotics, it very be becomes very cumbersome. Hey, I can't get a hold of the division. Or, you know, it goes through a process. And, and generally, I feel that if that was applied, you wouldn't really have those meetings happen in the state. And I feel like you would more or less fraction the, the falconry community. And, and getting together for meets or just getting together with your buddies to go and do the things because it would be such a process of trying to get their birds in and out of the state. Um, falconry is very regulated. I mean, for us to bring in a raptor, we have to have a health certificate, we have to have this and that. I mean, you know, you look at the, the pet trade, I mean, there's lots of birds coming to the state that really, I mean, I feel like, you know, would have more pose of a higher risk to bringing disease, whereas I feel like falconers were really much watched with permits and with health ships and everything. The other thing, uh, I guess, and just in last that I want to bring up is that, um, again, I want, the, I want the list to be as simple as possible as well, or, or the lack thereof list, so that we can, I guess, getting back to practicing falconry and not feel like we're just regulated as much. So that's mine. Thank you. Thank you. All right, last call for comments. That was the last one. All righty. Well, we'll bring it back to the board for discussion. Can we ask questions? Is there a question? I know it's not different from comments, but if we had a question for us, is, is now the appropriate time to ask that, or should we wait for that kind of stuff? Is it too late for that? All right, never I'll let you ask a question <laughs> because you're well behaved. Come up, but you got to come to the microphone and state your name. Russ, I think this is going your direction. So, my name is Caleb Stroh. I have a uh, question for Russ. Um, is there any kind of peer-reviewed science or data or anything that would suggest that these raptors do pose a human health or safety risk, or that they do pose some type of reintroduction risk, or or any of those things that were kind of addressed as reasons for that list, um, is there any proof to that? Is this just something we want to be proactive about, or is there some study that has suggested that that has ever been the case in the United States? I'm not aware of, of literature to suggest, I have, this is, well, first of all, I haven't done a complete literature search on this topic, so I can't formally fully answer that question. Um, we are using a risk, um, risk assessment and risk management protocol with this, the, the four criteria for evaluation of a species. Um, that's where that came from. It's a, it's a risk of importation risk. It's a risk to human health and safety is part of one of our responsibilities. Um, these are often species that have never occurred in Utah, so it's a novel situation, so there is no data on it to, there's no study as yet. Okay, understood. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. I guess to summarize what we got going on here. Can I just ask one more question? Um, You're the doctor. You can ask whatever you want. <laughs> I try not to come up with questions. <laughs> uh, what, tell us again, if you would, um, why the division is uh, opposed to going along with those federal guidelines. We feel the federal big sure. several hundred sure. bird 
yeah. place. Uh, we feel the federal guidelines are an appropriate basement to build upon. Uh, Utah has its own unique, unique uh, needs, conservation needs and responsibilities. Uh, to best meet those, we felt that the inclusion of the species that were most suitable for falconry, as, as defined in state statute, um, were those, was that list of 54. And by adding a, a mechanism to add additional species as they come, as be, we become aware of them or they're presented to us, that was our, our approach to creating an, an, an inclusive, useful list. However, there are, in the wide world of raptors uh, globally, there are a number of species which do not meet our definition of the sport of falconry. To keep those from, to keep the falconry rule from becoming a mechanism for possession of birds that are not suitable for falconry, for which that's a, there's, a, there's a different process through the CIP rule. That's, we didn't want the sport of falconry and the rule, the falconry rule to become muddied with that. That was one of the provisions, or the, one of the uh, impetus for uh, creating, creating this list. We have striven to err to the side of inclusiveness. It is uh, basically a, a widely inclusive list, a number of species that are marginal, but they've, these are species that have been used for falconry at some point by someone, so that seemed a reasonable use. And, and this list, the new list, that's bigger than what we've had in the past, is that Correct. right? It's one of the points that's come up in the RAC discussion was that, uh, and one of the points that we're here to correct, is that our prior rule was improperly constructed in that the list of allowed species lived outside the rule text as a table on the website, in the falconry website. That should have been incorporated into the, into the rule, and that's what you see in the red line copy. Russ, through the public comments we just heard, uh, it seemed like there was some general consensus for the board ops to not go with the list for these five uh, other criteria. But I did hear from one of the uh, speakers that the 14 species, uh, they believed that it should be 14 native species, but no limit on non-native or exotic species. I don't know what you've crafted in a potential rule that could replace this. How have you addressed that? And I think I, I heard that right through the public. Yeah, I should make, I should uh, emphasize that the proposal that that number, point number two on the, on the board is uh, for the, the 14 species, actually it should be 15 species in the proposed rule that you have before you in the red line copy. Um, that's all, just for the apprentices. Correct. Not all the 14 species that an apprentice would be allowed are uh, exclusively native, however. I'm going to ask Greg to speak to this. He's got more familiarity with the federal rule, which is, our again, our backstop or basement. Hi, Greg Hansen with the uh, Attorney General's Office, represent Wildlife Resources. Um, so within your, within your board packet, there's a section of rule that actually defines out uh, which species apprentices are allowed to possess. And uh, the, the kind of fallback proposal that's, that Russ has put together actually lays out, there's 15 proposed species that would be allowed, as well as uh, captive bred birds. So um, th th that's what gets complicated with the falconry rule is that you have, you have species, but then also hybrids, and whether they're wild caught or captive bred, and uh, pretty soon things get, get pretty complicated. But the, the fallback pr proposal that Russ is putting forward would essentially retain the species list for the apprentice section as it's included in your board packet um, with, with the minor exceptions that we would remove the division or the director's approval for adding additional species to that list it would just be the, the 14 or 15 species that are in the, the proposed text before you. And then at the general and master class level, we would fall back to the, uh, the federal standards um, w without the, the very restrictive um, proposal that was not very restrictive, but the, the initial proposal that was in your packet. Uh, 
that answer your concern or question? <coughs> All righty. Any other questions from the board? Anything else from the board? I guess as I could kind of look at this, well, I'll tell you, I don't know, I guess, why anybody would want to have a little owl that doesn't catch anything, but why that would be included in the falconry rule and, and, uh, and why we'd fight so hard to have that. On the other hand, I guess, Maybe it ain't that big of a deal. I guess there's, to me, there would be some value in in kind of keeping the the falconry rule limited to birds that you'd use in falconry and not just have as pets. But the rack process is kind of played out here. And uh, although I might disagree with with what their acts have come up with on a couple of little instances like that, I think that there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of information go back and forth. And the division has felt like they could come up with this uh, kind of a fallback plan and that that would be good and from what I'm hearing from the Falconers they feel like that is a, a reasonable compromise and only one of the racks went with the division's original proposal not that we are totally bound by that but we do put a lot of weight on what the racks come up with especially when it goes against or comes up with something alternative to the original proposal so, although personally I might disagree with a couple little things, I think overall this that we're looking at right here sounds pretty good. I think it's a good landing spot where both sides can <coughs> agree to meet and go from there. So, I mean, I don't make motions unless they're action log items, but I think uh, well, I'd, I think that'd be a good spot to, to start talking from. I don't want to belabor this any, but could you go through this list again just briefly and tell us about this uh, obviously that's the first time certainly the uh, the apprentice list yeah. <coughs> excuse me one second here we'll whatever's up on your you want me to read them off on the powerpoint you might not be able to see i'm sorry say again the, responding to the public comment five points that you've got so I'm, I, I, I just, can question. you go through those again and tell us why those are important five to you? Right there. Oh, the five, okay, yeah. certainly. Um, so the first is our ability to regulate the capture of wild, wild caught birds, native birds. Um, this is really fundamental to our ability to manage wildlife species. While the, if we go back to a federal list of those three, three families there, um, we still, we feel we still need the authority to regulate the number, the locations of those of, of take of, of take of wild species. We are re simultaneously responsible for the conservation of these species as well as the allowance for their use in the sport of falconry. So, without some ability to, uh, if we just roll back to the list without any stipulations, um, we lose that authority. That's why the first point. The second point is again, I think the that there are certain that learning the sport of falconry requires a certain uh, more constrained set of situations. So there are appropriate species for use in that. That said, even with our current proposal, those 15 and captive bred exotics, um, those, are or those are species that uh, may well step outside the line of what might be a good species to learn on, so to speak. However, we tried, we tried to err to the side of inclusiveness as we could. The uh, retaining the general class endorsement for eagle endorsements of the, the large raptor uh, is again another stipulation that we'd ask for to uh, ensure that the general class falconer who has 
the right to, uh, or the, the ability to uh, have these very large exotic raptors also has the skills, the experience, and the facilities to hold those raptors, both for the safety of the, of the falconer, but also for the bird themselves. We have a, a statute, we, we inherit that responsibility from the federal rule, the state agency does, that we have to maintain the, these birds in a humane conditions. Um, and to that last, that's the fourth point, to make sure that we can, in fact, fulfill our uh, responsibility under federal rule, we need to be able to know what birds are being held, where, and how many. And when there's a change, you can't, if you have a, a facility that's suitable for kestrels, you can't stuff an eagle in there. So that's just a fundamental piece we need to, to actually administer. You're saying you can't or you shouldn't? Shouldn't. Okay. <laughs> Should not. And again, the, the final thing is just the, the Fish and Wildlife Service requested ch small changes, typographical changes, um, references that came in after the RAC process. But none, none of these uh, rise to the level of a substantial change. And we'd be happy to review any of those. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, that question. Please. Yeah. Greg Hansen, if I could just add on to that as well. Um, the first three points that are up on that slide are largely already included in your red line copy. Um, the, these are three really, really critical points that if the, the species list at each class level entirely went away, these would be what we would need to retain in the rule um, to uh, essentially do the regulator's job of overseeing the, the sport of falconry. Um, there are some small changes that are needed at the general and master class level because we reference back to a species list that was initially created at the apprentice class level. Um, but the, if, you, if you keep that 14 species list at the, or 15 species list at the apprentice class level, um, you, you'll accomplish a lot of, uh, a lot of what, what's needed there. Point four, um, the, the reporting requirements that are laid out in the federal rule and also currently exist in our falconry rule, um, a lot of those requirements happen at, at an annual reporting stage. Um, when uh, a falconer, an apprentice falconer, goes to uh, apply for a COR, currently there's a facilities inspection, but when that facilities inspection is uh, undertaken, the, we don't know what species or the number of birds that the falconer is going to be requesting to house in that facility. And since we don't have a species list now to kind of box in um, what we can expect to see in those facilities, at the, that additional request at the application time would be uh, uh, an additional change to the rule that we would request in addition to what you have in your, your red line version right now. And that's number four. Yep, yep. that's point four. Yeah, so, point so that is inclusive in this. Yes, but, but not in your red line version. Yeah. Yeah. Um, points one through three are already largely included within your, your red line packet. When you uh, go from a, a list that's relatively small to one that's a little bit larger, one that's super large, what, what kind of uh, effect does that have on the pressure on different raptor species, wild raptor species that folks might be interested in catching and using? Do you have any? idea about that if I mean if you go from 14 to 50 whatever or 70 whatever are you going to reduce pressure on Harriers uh, potentially I guess that's since it's not ever happened before I don't I can't really speak to the how it's going to play out yeah. but given most of these exotic species to be legally possessed and legally possessable are often from a captive breeding program um, and can be quite expensive not to mention the facilities required to house some of these large exotic raptors. There's a substantial commitment of both time and resources just to acquire one of these legally. Um, so my my guess is that it might draw some away from the native from pressure on native species, uh, which is not great to begin with. As I mentioned, this is only there's only 250 practicing raptors falconers and, in the state, and that might be part of the lore of falconry as well, right? To go out and catch your own bird. Certainly that's I a guess. that's an important part of a sort of rite of passage if you will. It, the, just so I'm clear there though, 
we're not, if we were to go with the RAC's proposals and, and open up that, that, that's not changing current. It's not, the proposal from the division would be changing current and, and, and sizing that down. The, what we've got from the RACs, the proposals from the RACs, would be status quo. It wouldn't be opening up a whole new availability list. It's just keeping where we are right now. So it wouldn't change what they're already doing. Uh, is that if, right? I don't think if that's if right. I may. Is it, uh, go to the federal as our, as our our current rule is, as I mentioned, improperly constructed. So the, the species of the approved species list lived outside the rule. There is honest debate about whether or not that's enforceable as is. We have been using that list as policy and practice um, as, our, as our list of approved species. However, additional species have been approved outside that list along the way um, by prior, prior coordinators, et cetera. And the federal rule is just the three? Correct. And that's our that's our probably Which a fallback legal backstop. The fallback, yeah. correct. I think uh, I'll say this. I think this is an excellent example of why you go to the RAC meeting. I think the RAC process served the public well here. If this is going to go the way I think it's going to go, and this is a great example of our division of wildlife being the best in the country and being the most user friendly when their proposal has evolved with the public comment they got through the process and then now we're here and instead of having a big bloody fight the last meeting we have something put together that it looks like everybody can work with and, and deal with so i think that speaks volumes to the to the public and to the division, so and to the and to the rack to the rack meetings and the rack process, especially. Uh, <coughs> any other questions or anything from the board? I I just want to make a couple of comments, John. That I think this work in progress has really you know come to a, a final conclusion. That we're protecting raptors, and we're taking away the restrictions to give these people. That participate in the sport the opportunity to continue to do that and expand their you know horizons a little bit but uh, I think it's the best world for everybody that's commented here today those for and those against that uh, especially what the division has done with these last two uh, bullet points four and five one through three are already included in the process that the racks have approved so I just want to you know thank you know, all the Falcons and stuff are showing up and uh, Wasatch Audubon, the comments that we've received and stuff. So it's a, don't wait, yep. I think it's a, the best document we can come up with and work with. I'd be open to a motion at this point. I'd make that motion, John, that we accept the division's recommendation, recommendation and that we incorporate these five PowerPoints, or five points that they brought up onto the public comment. So to be cl clear, if you if you Spring accept range. the division's proposal, you don't need this. Right. The the, the well, division's the proposal, of, uh, with the exception of the list, right. then you would need these. Yes. Yep. So the like the we're accepting the division's proposal, right. how, with the exception of there will be no list, right. and we're incorporating these five points. Is right. that correct? Yes. That makes sense. <laughs> so. <laughs> Help us flesh it out then, Mike. So well, I, the, the, what is the division's proposal? That we do what they have said and that we keep a list that the division has, right? The division's initial proposal was Russ's first presentation, including the all-encompassing list at each class level. Uh, the slide that's before you right now is an alternative for you to include in a motion, if you so choose. But do we need that if we accept the division's proposal as it no. is? But that's, I, it, I thought that this was if we rejected the list that they have and wanted to go back to or to the federal the list. Proposal. So the division's proposal was the initial okay. 54 bird list. Right. The slide that's before you is an alternative that you can adopt in a motion if you so choose. 
and or pieces of it. Well, yeah, it said, I mean, the first, second sentence says, if the board determines the list is not a, the appropriate course of action, we want this. So uh, what list are we talking about there? The, the list that the division has proposed. So within the current red line rule, there are species, authorized species at each class level. Right. Uh, the RAC votes, as we went through the RAC process, requested that we eliminate away with all, all of those and fall back to the, the orders that are included in the federal rule. Uh, as a compromise proposal, this is one idea that you could adopt instead of the proposed species list that the division initially requested and the orders that are laid out within the federal rule. So for clarification, the motion that Byron just presented was that we would accept the division's proposal minus the 54 species list and add the five points that the division asked to add if we rejected the 54 species list. That's the proposal, is that correct, That's Byron? Right. That's accurate. So if we, if we rejected that list, then we could accept this as a way to mitigate the rejection of the list. That's accurate. And I would just want to... And that's the motion. And I would just want to clarify that point number two, our proposed red line actually includes 15 species. So not 14, we, we want 15, 15 not 14. Th that's bullet point number two, not yes. 14, that is 15. That is 15. So if we accept the motion, Byron's motion, that 14 would actually be 15. That, that's correct. What, what, so what happens then if uh, somebody wants to bring in some exotic bird? Uh, and that would depend on what class they are. As an apprentice class falconer, if you adopted the slide, they would be restricted to the 15 birds uh, that it would be included in the rule. Okay. At the general and master class level, they would not have that same restriction. Plus, Chuck and Greg have said also on the apprentice yeah. level. Yep. So, so long at, at the apprentice level, they could only bring in the 15 species that are listed there. So is the federal list then a non? It's the at the general at, at the general and master class level. It would be the federal backstop um, that we've then incorporated into our list. But you don't um, with so and to clarify that the if you look at let me see that would be point three um, at the general class level there that eagle endorsement concept. Uh, for the five or six really large animal species. Uh, in order to possess the species that are listed within that at the general class level, you'd have to have a couple letters of recommendation and show some, some experience handling other large raptors before you would be allowed to possess uh, like an eagle owl or harpy eagle. Um, there are five or six species that are listed at the general class level that we think require um, some additional expertise before you can just uh, bring those into the state. So as far as that big federal list from those three orders, mm -hmm. um, that is not the rule, right? You, if somebody chose something off of that list and wanted to bring it into Utah, have it in Utah, it would have to get approval, right? It's not, you Dep can just have it because it's on that federal list? Depending on your class level, that's correct. Um, well, if you're, the, if you're the master class, the king of all kings, whatever it is, yep. and can so, you get any bird you want to anytime you want to without any restriction? Um, and, and at the master class level, the federal rule, and our, our rule adopts these same restrictions, uh, Master class cannot possess a bald eagle. Uh, for a golden eagle, there are certain uh, golden eagle, uh, stellar sea eagle, and white-tailed eagle. There are uh, a set of expectations and restrictions that you have to comply with in order to possess those species. 
but beyond that, you would be within the three orders. Um, but so then can you have that, any from those three yep, orders? Yep. Um, which, which gets you know. Some somewhat concerning, I guess, when we start talking about doing away with the list or incorporating another list, is that there there's a lot that goes into the list, um, and with these five points here, we think we've uh, probably accomplished what we want to accomplish, um, and, and can remove the 54 species concept that has been so contentious through the the RAC process. Okay, so if we remove the 54 list the division is okay with that as long as these are in place so long as we substitute substitute in these concepts um, I think it's something that we can live with I can't speak for my client but well um, who's who what's the division's position that's what I want to know this is something that we think we can respect the rack process and and live with it's uh, it's obviously not what we'd uh, recommended to the, to the board and to the director. Um, it will add complexity and uh, some challenges to the administration of the program, given this is a quite small program overall. Uh, however, uh, with these uh, stipulations or provisions, it's something that we can live with, yes. It's not doing backflips over it. Mm. We have a motion. Do I have a second on the motion? Can we? <laughs> now you can discuss it still if you need to. I want to know what the motion is again. <laughs> John, can I ask something? Isn't there a process to be able to have any of these birds as a falconer? Don't they have to get approval for any of them, right? That doesn't change. Okay. You have these birds that specialize on skunks and raccoons. <laughs> that that solved the other to, problem we talked about. No, I stipulate that every falconer has to take, you know, a hundred of the exotic Eurasian dove that we have That's per right. year or something like that. Hunters <laughs> can do that. Okay. Stacy, can you read back the motion? <laughs> it's real you have it written down right read it back to me please That's it. That's it. Okay. Any further, I hate to ask this, any further discussion? <laughs> All in favor of the motion? All opposed? Well, I think partly because I'm still confused on a few issues, and I, 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 I just don't see the ultimate uh, need to do away with what the division has, has uh, proposed. I mean, I'm fine with it. That's no, that's no problem if they think they can handle what they need. But where are you going to get your money to take care of all this stuff when it shows up? And what personnel are you going to pull away from what projects to do? Those kind of things still. All right. The motion passes four to one. So uh, I, can, I can appreciate where Mike's coming from because I, this is one I was glad I didn't have to vote on because I had some concerns, but I also <coughs> have faith in the process and in the division. I don't think they'd have come back with this if they if it was something they couldn't have, couldn't have uh, got a hold of and, and made work. So now that is the last of our action items. Uh, it's not quite lunchtime yet, so the board does have a little bit of board business that we're going to take care of here for a few minutes.
I would like to thank all of the public for coming and uh, speaking to your items today. And uh, anybody that's out there watching that thinks rack meetings don't get things accomplished and you can't make a difference, I think the Falconers just proved you wrong. So I appreciate you guys coming and being involved. Uh, I guess as a board, we uh, we have a couple of us that are done, me and the good doctor. And so you will need a new chairman for the next go around. Uh, we have some ballots here. Ballot initiative going around. Everybody registered. Now, uh, is there a way to extend their their <laughs> term? <laughs> you notice she spoke right up about that. Uh, also, I guess we it'd probably be appropriate if if. Uh, yeah, so we would probably want to nominate somebody for the. I I, I don't know if it's, it's formal nominations. I think I think if and the the way this will happen is there'll be two votes here. First will be for the board chair. Once that's done and we know what it is, then there'll be voting for the vice chair. So uh, probably the simplest way to do this is for those who would express interest in being the future chair person chairman of this board to make that known. I, I um, talked to Calvin Crandall here in the last uh, 15 minutes or so on the phone. Um, he does have some interest as potentially a vice chair, but not as the chair. So at this point, we could move forward on discussion of the chair. Stacy, a couple questions. Chairman is a, is a two-year ordeal, right? You, you're only chairman for two years, so if you were, regardless of whether you're coming off the board, if you have four years left and you get voted on as chairman, you're chairman for two years and then you're done as chairman and you're just, and let they vote you in again. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a name out there. I think my compadre next to me here, Dr. Woodward, would be an excellent chairman. I think he's filled in a few times when I've been later, had things to deal with and that. And I think he's got a good grasp as to what goes on. And he uh, brings a level of professionalism that I would say has been lacking in the chairman position for the last <laughs> couple of years. <laughs> so I would think if he'd be interested in that, I think he'd, he'd do a great job. I think all of you'd do a great job, but I think her could be, would be exceptional. Well, I, you need to vote. I mean, you got there's th there's four of you, so I'd say you need to vote unless there's somebody else that that wants to do it. I mean, I guess we could. Unless you don't want it. I mean, I know those are big shoes to fill, buddy. But hey. <laughs> <laughs> Just continue to follow in Max Morgan's footsteps. <laughs> That's right. Who is somebody I respect completely Immensely. and yes. and is part of the reason why I'm here. Um, now that you mention his name and and uh, I, I think that he's a he's a wonderful example to 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 follow. And um, I've always said that I that this is a labor of love for me. I enjoy doing what I do, even though it's it's very difficult to do. I can't imagine adding another minute of responsibility to my day. Um, my my life is quite full right now, um, uh, but I am committed to doing what I can here. So, I'll, I'll, if that's the case, and and I'm voted in, I guess I would do that. It's, it's not much more time. I can do 
yeah, you say that, but I don't trust you. I've never. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I said it's. It's. I, I'll tell you this. It's not like additional meetings and and whatnot. It 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 is at times additional phone calls and maybe some some emails with the good people here at the headquarters. But it's it's uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I can tell you that. I I was I didn't think I would, but I've thoroughly enjoyed being the chairman. So we've all enjoyed your job. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a? Uh, no. Are we are we going to vote? You can abstain if you want. I'll, I'll, I'm, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it this way. Is there anybody? Sealed. All right. Pass them down, and we'll see what your all three guys. We'll see what they think of you. Oh, I'm a voter too. I'm voting for the doctor on the record. Okay. All right. In modern day political fashion, there's how many of us on the board? One, two, three, four, five, six. We have ten votes in favor of Dr. Woodward. I added one. <laughs> okay. Calvin is not here, and he asked me to proxy vote for him in favor of Dr. Woodward. Should he? There you go. The challenge. For the record, I voted for him. <laughs> I, th I, th I think we have a new chairman. Okay. Congratulations, sir. Uh, I, I do appreciate the, that trust, um, and I don't look forward to trying to uh, fill the boots <laughs> and you, buckle jeans you, that you wear. Yes. That was a low blow. We had one yeah. vote for Calvin Crandall. Yeah, from him. Okay. And that's fine. He okay, did, now, we need a, job, so. now we need a vice chairman. Okay. Now the vice chairman actually... Uh, there is some there is some work there. Uh, the vice chairman usually keeps track of the action log. Thanks to John, there's a lot of work there now. <laughs> okay, pass them down. Is anybody else interested? Calvin has expressed a little interest. Is anybody else interested in the vice chair? I'd be interested in that job. You would, Byron. Okay, so we have Byron and Calvin as options. Anybody on this side, Donnie? No? Sound pretty stern there. <laughs> okay. So it's between Byron and Calvin. Wanna make a speech, Byron? Wanna make a speech? You're gonna get my comments anyway and stuff like that if I'm the <laughs> vice chair. So. <laughs> but uh, I just think that I could uh, help Dr. Wimmer what we're doing, you know, a great job to continue what the board does and stuff like that. and. Uh, Talk to people around the state and work with people around the state like that to make this, uh, you know, the best wildlife board, you know, in the nation and stuff. So, with that, that's all I'd say. Pass them down. And the, yeah. and he'll, uh, pat, you got to fill them out, and then the the uh, the director. Secretary, yeah. But you are the director. You are the executive secretary, but you are the director still. And while he counts those up, Mike, you got anything you want to say? Is this is our last meeting? It's been real. <laughs> uh, it's been great. It's been a good experience. Enjoyed it. Appreciate working with you all and uh, all the division personnel. It's been a real a reward for me to be able to rub shoulders and learn things. It's uh, been helpful to me personally and hopefully professionally. I've appreciated Mike's, Mike's uh, up until today, his, uh, <laughs> his, his reasoning, and, and I appreciate uh, his knowledge and, uh, and his temperate uh, views on things that, that have helped me. Uh, so I, I appreciate that, and I would appreciate you continuing in the process at, the, at that rack level as you, as you visit. And I know that that's a hassle to drive all the way to Green River for that, for that rack, but... 
I could go be part of the two-person public. I'm sure that that on the fishing that 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 input is is uh, is important, and and as we've seen today, the the rack process is important. And if you continue to promote that, I I would appreciate that very much down in the southeastern region. You know, I'll kind of throw in there too with Dr. King. He's he uh, me and him vote opposite ways on occasion, but I can very much appreciate uh, his academic background and his biological background and he brings just a, a very important dynamic to the board and uh, you know he, he's one of the guys you can talk about you can discuss you can disagree with and it's always professional and it's always on a very uh, very good level and uh, really enjoyed getting to know him and, and to work with him I can't believe the six years is gone but uh, you know and I I just have to say is it's my last meeting and uh, just want to tell the good people at the Division of Wildlife how much I love and appreciate them and their work and their efforts and their dedication <laughs> to Utah's wildlife I mean and I've said it a lot of times I'll say it again we have the best the vision of wildlife in the country. And that's not to say there aren't some other great ones, but I wouldn't trade ours for 10 of anybody else. And uh, I think we have the most user-friendly. We have the most uh, pro-public input process in the country. And I think our division just bends over backwards to make sure people feel like they're included. And uh, I hope people realize it. There's a difference between being disagreed with and not being listened to. And I hope everybody that's come through this process has felt like they've been listened to. I can guarantee you there's a bunch of them that know they haven't been agreed with at one time or another. I've been on that side of the coin myself, uh, standing at these microphones out here. And, and But I never did feel like I wasn't listened to. And I would hope that everybody that, uh, that uh, has been involved in the in the rack process and that would know that uh, we really appreciate their efforts serving on the racks serving as the chairman and uh, I can tell you I uh, serving on this board it's an easy decision until it's your decision you all think you know exactly what you do until it comes time to cast your vote and when you got so many different user groups and so many different people that I mean their livelihoods and their hundred year family traditions and everything hang on your vote you you give it a lot of thought you give it a lot of thought and uh it's been an honor i've enjoyed it and uh i'll miss it but i'll still be involved in one way or another i i want to tell our girls over here station too how much i appreciate their effort and their work behind the scenes these meetings and all this information doesn't get passed around and that without these girls over here just staying after it so that and and Lindy and all the good folks that that work in licensing and go over just tons and tons of numbers just to answer questions that we have that we're getting for the public I mean this this process has got a lot of people that work just countless hours that don't get up to the microphone very often that we don't know you know all the work they put in but they they just work really hard because they love to hunt, they love to fish, and they love wildlife. And I'll tell you, you can disagree with me if you want, but we have it because we hunt it. We have wildlife because we hunt wildlife. And I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at that. So appreciate it, and thanks to everybody. Thank you, John. On, on behalf of all of us up here, I'm sure that we, we will miss you. We'll miss your leadership. We'll miss your uh, uh, wit. Um, <laughs> your ability to 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 run a meeting um, and to make it enjoyable for all of us to be here. Thank you for your passion, and uh, we appreciate your willingness to share it. I think also it probably needs to be noted that uh, John's wife is in the audience, and she has shared uh, hours and hours of you with us, and so uh, probably. She likes that. She's well, really, I, you know what, I should have, yeah, I should have, I should have recognized my wife. My wife has gone to a few rack meetings with me, but she's never able to attend a board meeting. And so 
she's a school teacher. She got out of school last week, and so I invited her and my youngest daughter, Emma, and they both came up and uh, spent the day with us here at the board meeting to see what it's all about. And I'm, and I, I know that kind of goes for all of us that are involved in this process. That are, it, it's very rewarding, but your families do pay a price, and and they they're without you a lot of nights you're at meetings and open houses and whatnot and you burn up all your vacation time to come to board meetings instead of go to disneyland so uh, i appreciate my family's willingness to uh to also be part of the process so thank you again john yes thank you very much do, well, do we do we have a vice chairman <laughs> mr chairman there were uh Two votes in favor of Calvin Crandall as vice chair and five in favor of Byron Bateman. Byron, congratulations. You'll, Thank you. You guys will do a great job. Uh, I guess that brings to close the formal public portion of our meeting. We do have a time certain board appeal at one o'clock and it will be in here. So. Having said that, we're going to go to lunch, and uh, we'll need the board back Want by be here 5 to 1 so we can uh, get on with our board appeal, and that will conclude the day. Okay. All right.